What happens in a black hole stays in a black hole. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science, now infamous Tangent Cube. Ah. <laughs> this is episode 77. From the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. And uh, we got a lot of interesting stuff to talk about, I think. Stuff that I'm interested in. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> Many disparate things and lots of, a lot of great stories coming out in the, in the news lately. Very strange oh, yeah. anomalies. But first, we are joined, as always, from his secret bunker deep beneath his secret, secret space station in secret outer space, Mr. Brett England, the Longhead Watcher. How you doing, buddy? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> hey guys hey buddy excited for another one what Feels was like i do this four sometimes five times a month i love it <laughs> yeah well okay tell us what was the thing with number 77 oh yeah so apparently um the number 77 in terms of numerology and spirituality is um the number associated with the angel so it's a a messenger someone carrying a divine message of great importance oh that is the number 77 uh-huh. so so this i'm not saying that we're a big deal <laughs> but uh <laughs> we're kind of a big deal <laughs> or maybe just, maybe just this podcast episode is kind of a big deal this is coming straight from god <laughs> those uh <laughs> <laughs> Those radio waves know exactly when to disrupt whatever you're saying. Yeah. yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying we're a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, how's the weather up there, watcher? <laughs> it's a little turbulent. I think it's interfering with my signal. <laughs> All right, let's see. We got Space Weather News from spaceweather.com. A CME impact possible this week. NOAA forecasters say there is a 45% chance of a G1 class geomagnetic storm on December 5th when a coronal mass ejection or a CME is expected to hit Earth's magnetic field. CMEs are rare during solar minimum, which is what we're in, because their usual launching pads, that is sunspots, are absent. This one was produced not by a sunspot, but rather by a filament of magnetism erupting from the sun's southern hemisphere. CMEs are very good at producing auroras, so even a glancing blow could light up the Arctic Circle this Wednesday night. A filament of magnetism erupting <laughs> magna explosions <laughs> I, I don't know gigantic solar magna explosions vol magnos <laughs> giant mountains of magnets <laughs> that explode in magnetic fields <laughs> vol magnos <laughs> a vol magneto on the st- on the sun <laughs> do they call it magma <laughs> i don't know <laughs> Magna. <laughs> magna. Yeah. The ball magna exploded and magna is rolling down the sides. <laughs> magna. Yeah, that's right. I mean, like, what is a filament of magnetism? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's awesome. Tell me more. That's it. That's all there is. But the other, the, okay. So no, I was talking to the to the journalist. Oh, yeah, the yeah. science journalist. The other bit of space for the news is that the Geminids begins tonight. The oh. Geminids meteor shower. And it, it, in my opinion, the Geminids are the best. They have- The if twins. You, what? Right? Gemini? Yes, Gemini. But it's, it's the Geminids are the best because they have the highest, uh, on average, you know, number of meteors per hour or whatever. So if you look online, you could see like a, a scale of which ones are and Geminids are the, the they have the highest. So that you can see potentially hundreds of meteors an hour. Okay. So, so we have the Geminids, the Leonids, the Perseids. Perseids. Yeah. There's a whole. But there's one for every month Is, practically. Are they all uh, on the plane of the ecliptic? Like the they're, they're named after where they appear to radiate from. Right in the sky. Right. But, yeah. But but Gemini and Leo Leo are on the yes because the 
everything is in the plane of the ecliptic of the sun, basically. There's nothing coming from really high. That's what I was right, yeah, to yeah. make sure. So. As far as I know, yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, like, oh. some comets come from extremely, like, obtuse angles or, yeah. like, you know, like 70 degrees below or yeah. whatever. But but the, as far as I know, most of the meteor showers that we associate with, like, like the meteor showers are actually in eccentric orbits that cross Earth. Okay. But the long-term comets will go, like, 70 degrees down and just... Yeah. They can go, they can orbit for hundreds of thousands of years if the projections are correct. Like that one, do you do you remember that one that went around the sun and then just vanished a couple of years ago? I can't. Everybody thought it was going to be amazing, and it came in, and like NASA had this ongoing thing on their website where it was they were constantly retracking it and calculating the orbit, right? And the, the like, so like the orbit was showing you the, the length, the period of the orbit, and it kept going up and up and up and up. And when it finally was getting close in and they were actually getting real good data, it just maxed out at 500,000 and stopped. Yeah. yeah, basically, the minute that it. Oh, uh, yeah, the other one's the Torrids. The Torrids, too. yeah, the one that kills us all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not before we kill the Apis bull. <laughs> okay. I have, uh, I have something about. <sighs> I, this sort of has a connection to space weather news. Okay. Okay. Harvard scientists to release sun dimming sky chemical. <laughs> They're going to put a chemical in the sky that shall dim the sun. Great. <clears throat> no, that's not actually what it's going to do, folks. <laughs> but it, okay. Yeah. It will we dim need, the light hitting us. Right. It will not no, dim the sun. We need to sun. turn the sun down, guys. <laughs> it's too, it's somebody left it on high. <laughs> Sky doctors. <laughs> okay, this is from uh, futurism.com. Sky doctors. A longstanding idea to fight the catastrophic predicted effects of climate change is to release a compound into the stratosphere that would reflect some of the sun's energy back into space. Last week, a new report estimated that a sunlight dimming program could cost as little as $2 billion per year. <laughs> now, in a first-of-its-kind experiment, researchers from Harvard are preparing to release calcium carbonic or carbonate into the stratosphere in 2019 a small-scale trial that could provide crucial data about the potential risks and rewards of a larger-scale geoengineering effort. Sunblockers. The Harvard experiment will operate a at a tiny scale, according to Nature, uh, which is a magazine. Right. <laughs> the researchers will send a steerable balloon up into the stratosphere where it will release about 100 grams of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, which is the active ingredient in antacids, is a tempting candidate for geoengineering efforts because stimula simulations show that it could stay in the air for years as it reflects sunlight. After releasing the calcium carbonate, the balloon will use a laser imaging system to watch how the particles disperse. Data the researchers can use to model how larger quantities of the substance might behave. Stratosphere. <laughs> this is how they're catalog cataloging like the <laughs> stratosphere. Stratosphere. <laughs> Critics say that geoengineering effort, efforts are Band-Aid solutions to treat the symptoms of climate change mm. instead of the cause, global carbon emissions. Jim Thomas, the co-executive director of an environmental advocacy organization called the ETC Group, told Nature, the magazine, that he fears the Harvard Project could push the concept of geoengineering into the mainstream. But advocates say that anything that could buy some extra time in the face of looming climate catastrophe Ugh. Catastrophe is worth exploring. I'm studying a chemical substance. Harvard research a Zendai told Nature. It's not like it's a nuclear bomb. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, that's that's the article. So the watcher says calcium carbonate is strongly heated until it undergoes thermal decomposition to form calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> Just to pause for effect there. Yeah. Uh, the other thing <clears throat> that I want to mention about that, calcium carbonate is most of what limestone is made of. The entire uh, lithosphere, you know, the, the, the sedimentary lithosphere of the earth is calcium carbonate. And the thing that causes massive ice ages when giant comets or other, you know, uh, meteoritic meteoritic objects impact land is it throws up all that car some calcium carbonate into the air uh, and then makes the world freeze right okay so it does work but but 
okay. What I was thinking is it's like, this is the fact that it will stay up there for so long. It's like, man, do you really want to try to that, cool this right. down? I mean, look yeah. at every other period when the earth was cold and look at what was going on with life. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So I'm conflicted on this. I'm conflicted on this. Like on one hand, I, I, I sort of, I sort of, I'm like, you guys could be really messing stuff up here. But on the other hand, at least they're trying a solution that doesn't involve like massive, gigantic governments controlling everybody all the time. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I love it too. Let's put some dust in the air and see if we can cool things down and maybe people will cool off. Yeah, and chill out. Yeah, yeah, you know exactly. Know you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Ty, for sending me that story. That was a good one. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so let's see. I've got this. <laughs> what? What do you mean, Watcher? Ding, ding, ding. Oh, he's saying he's ding, ding, chime in. ding, ding, ding about what I said about the the, oh, okay. the asteroid impacts winner, throwing up all this. Winner, <laughs> winner, winner, winner. And he also calls these guys dim wits. <laughs> 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 That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't want to criticize them too badly because at least they're going for solutions that are. No, I totally agree with yeah. that. I'm not criticizing. I, I think that the entire premise of the problem is totally wrong, but at least they're looking for solutions that doesn't involve like turning us all back into the Stone Age. Yeah. Technically. Maybe the Stone Age was actually more badass than what we're in now. But <laughs> yeah. you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this was sent to us by loyal listener, emailer, and Twitter follower Patrick. Texas A and M uh, professor finds the oldest weapons ever discovered in North America. This is cool. Uh, Texas A&M University researchers have discovered what are believed to be the oldest weapons ever found in North America, ancient spear points that are 15,500 years old. The findings raise new questions about the settlement of early peoples on this continent. Michael Waters, distinguished professor of anthropology and director of the Center for the Study of the First Americans at Texas A&M, and colleagues from Baylor University and the University of Texas, have had their work published in the current issue of Science Advances. The team found the numerous weapons about three to four inches long while digging at what has been termed the Deborah L. Friedkin site, named for the family who owns the land about 40 miles northwest of Austin in central Texas. The site has undergone extensive archaeological work for the past 12 years. Spear points made of chert and other tools were discovered under several feet of sediment that dating revealed to be 15,500 years old and predate the Clovis. Yeah. Who for decades were believed to be the first people to enter the Americas. There is no doubt these weapons were used for hunting game in the area at that time, Waters said. The discovery is significant because almost all pre-Clovis sites have stone tools, but spear points have yet to be found. These points were found under a layer with Clovis and Folsom projectile points. Clovis is dated to 13 to 12,700 years ago, and Folsom is a little bit after that. The dream has always been to find diagnostic artifacts, such as projectile points, that can be recognized as older than Clovis, and this is what we have found at the Friedkin site. Clovis is the name given to the distinctive tools made by people and blah, 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 we know all this stuff. The findings expand our understanding of the earliest people to explore and settle North America, Waters said. The peopling of the Americas during the end of the last ice age was a complex process, and this complexity is seen in their genetic record. Now we are starting to see this complexity mirrored in the archaeological record. So, very interesting there. Heck yeah. <clears throat> More stuff in Texas for, like the other thing they found was that mammoth bone with the, right, with the tool marks yeah. on it. <clears throat> That was also in Texas. So that one was dated 22,000 years ago. So fascinating stuff. Thanks, Patrick. And any of you other guys, anybody else listening, if you send us articles like this, like you link us articles, we'll go through it. And it's very possible we'll read it on the show because we like to know what you guys are interested in. So, yeah. you know, if you're interested in something, you read an article, email us the link and I. We yeah. will we will don't, totally not vet it. And don't just send them all to Russ, man. <laughs> he gets all the best ones. You gotta send some to me. PM me. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna say anything about that. Just PM me. <laughs> okay, do you want to do the uh, the be the ringing like a bell thing? We got it because no, we go have it. we have both articles. Okay, so we well, got, I got two this huge article. I don't want to read the whole thing. Right. No. Right, but I've got a small article that sort of gives an outline, and then you can give more details from yours. Is that You think Go that'll work? It. Go for it. Okay. So, New York Post. This is from the New York Post, and I got this from uh, the Daily Grail. They actually linked this to me. Okay. <clears throat> Nobody knows why the earth just rang like a bell. 
is the name of the, is the headline. <laughs> Seismic sensors first picked up the event originating near an island between Madagascar and Africa. Then alarm bells started ringing as far away as Chile, New Zealand, and Canada. Hawaii, almost exactly on the other side of the planet, also picked up the event. No one knows what it was. Meteorite? Submarine volcano? Nuclear test? I don't think I've seen anything like it. National Geographic reports Columbia University seismologist Goran Ekstrom as staying. It doesn't mean that, in the end, the cause of them is that exotic. In other words, I think what he's saying there is, just because we don't know what it is, doesn't, doesn't mean it's weird. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At the center of the mystery is the tiny island of Mayotte, which is how I think I think it's pronounced that way. M A Y O T T E. I'm just going with Mayotte. Position about halfway between Africa and Madagascar. What, what's going on there? <laughs> the it's, website plays a video. Oh, okay. It's, it's been so. <laughs> it's <pissing> me off. <laughs> when was the last time that happened to you? <laughs> 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 this only happens every 16 years. This yeah. is the last time yeah, yeah. that happened to you. <laughs> okay. So at the center of the mystery is the tiny island of Mayotte, positioned about halfway between Africa and Madagascar. It's been subjected to a swarm of earthquakes since May. Most have been minor, but the biggest on May 8th was the largest in the island's recorded history, topping at a magnitude of 5.8 on the Richter scale. But the earthquake, squ uh, earthquake swarm had been in decline before the mysterious, mysterious ringing was detected earlier this month. Ekstrom, who specializes in unusual earthquakes, but just because they're unusual doesn't mean they're weird, as he <laughs> points out, points out much about the November 11th event was weird. <laughs> it was as though the planet rang like a bell, maintaining a low-frequency monotone as it spread. <clears throat> earthquakes, by their very nature, usually register as short, sharp, crack sounds. As tensions in the Earth's crust suddenly release, pulses of clearly identifiable seismic waves radiate outward from where the slippage occurs. The first signal is called a primary wave, high-frequency compression waves that radiate in bunches. Then comes a secondary wave. These high-frequency waves tend to wiggle more. Only then come the surface waves. These slow, deep rumbles tend to linger and can circle the Earth several times. The November 11th event is notable in that no primary or secondary waves were detected. All that was registered was the deep, resonant surface wave. And it didn't rumble as an earthquake's surface wave tends to. Instead, it maintained a much cleaner, almost musical frequency. National Geographic reports the French Geological Survey suspects a new volcano may be developing off the coast of Mayotte. While the island was created by volcanic activity, it's been dormant for more than 4,000 years. The French believe the weird ringing may have been generated by a movement of magma some 30 miles off the coast and deep underwater. This is supported by GPS sensors detecting that Mayotte, the island, has moved some two inches to the southeast in less than five months. But it's a poorly mapped region. Exactly what's beneath the ocean can only be guessed at. Ekstrom believes the unusually pure signal could have been caused by magma sloshing about inside of a chamber or being forced through a gap in subsurface rocks. But he's not certain. Good. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the article I have is from National Geographic. And it if you want to check this out, it's a really good article. I'm not going to read the whole thing here. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if I'm going to read it. You can just look up National Geographic Earth Ring Like Bell. Yeah, but it has a really good description of the the different waves uh, as they go through, you know, like a, a typical um, earthquake. And then... Um, talks about the geology in the area and everything. It's it's really good. I, I'm having trouble like trying to scan it to find other parts, so I'm not going to do that. Well, we kind of read it back and forth beforehand, so we could sort of just discuss basically what it said, right? Unless yeah. you want to directly quote these guys. No. I was just looking for that one thing about how weird it is. The guy, this... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very complex filter. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, so they're they're talking about how complex the geology is in the area, and somehow they're saying maybe the extreme complexity in the geology in the area is what causes the extreme simplistic wave coming out. And they're like, what? What? <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> anyway, it to me like the first thing I thought of was whistling, right? Like that's what I I don't know if if 
this makes sense to you, but like it kind of says this at the end of this article that he suspects a movement of magma through like a small, like think of it, you know, it's like, it's like some small channel opens up and underneath it is magma under extreme pressure. And above that, above that small channel is a large space for the magma to move into, or maybe it just creates its own space as it, inf you know, it comes out and inflates or whatever. But as it's moving through this little tiny aperture, it whistles. It basically mm -hmm. whoo, makes a but humming noise. this is noise. a 17-second vibration. Like right. That, yeah. The frequency was 17 seconds. Right. So that's like a... It's whistling. It's just really low. <laughs> yeah. <Ooh. laughs> the, like in that article, in the National Geographic article, they go into more detail about the magma chamber and how there's like a sloshing effect and it's... You yeah, know, very regular. It's causing this sort of like boom, boom, boom. Yeah, like, yeah. So that could be easier for me to uh, see that that could take 17 seconds for the whole thing to go from one, yeah, you know, position to the other. Right. Yeah. Incredibly. But, it, but the other thing that was I didn't catch the first time, and then when you're reading it again, it's like every volcanic or every er, you know major earthquake has this. Profile. Global ringing that happens. Oh, yeah. So At the, the very it, end, yeah. So it's like the headline makes it seem like earthquake felt around the world. <laughs> and they're all felt around the world by these seismic, seismic sensors. Yeah. Seismic sensors was basically what they were saying. This one just didn't have the. The precursor waves. Right. That yeah. were that tell you where it originated from. Really. Right. The, what they call the P wave and then the second wave. Right. Yeah. P and S waves. Yeah. P.S. Yeah. P.S. Yeah. Giant earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what about the giant earthquake in, uh, where was it? Anchorage. Anchorage, yeah. I don't know. I don't have an article on that one. I but saw I'd... a picture of this, one of the of a road. It was just taken from above, like from a drone. Yeah. Holy crap. Like Yeah, just... that one was like a seven point something on the Richter scale. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, there was a, Mysterious Universe did have an article, I didn't. I don't have this queued up, but maybe I can find it for after the break or something, but the Mysterious Universe did have an article that Brenner sent to us, uh, talking about how people were saying that it was due to planetary alignments. Like there was oh, some yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. alignment, and they were saying that that earthquake in, in Anchorage was caused by this alignment. Yeah. So, I could, maybe I can look that up if we... Proof, astrology is correct. <laughs> 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 you might be a big shakeup tomorrow. That's right. Planets are aligning. <laughs> Says your horoscope. That's right. <laughs> you got to meet a dark earthquake. <laughs> <coughs> uh, okay, so I also So have yeah, 17 second wave 0 0.0588 hertz. Yeah. Still a frequency, bro. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I love how they call it like a, a you know the whole ringing like a bell is pretty funny to me. Like, is it really ringing like a bell? Is it? I, I guess I need to look into actual bell physics. Like, <laughs> what does ringing like a bell really mean? Because a bell to me, like it's it's got this. The planet doesn't just because there's like a ping on one side and then these waves go out and sort of go around it. Is that what a bell does? I think they mean the the um, regular like the periodicity. I guess. Oh. Like it's music constant period, right? It's a it's okay. a regular frequency. It's not, it's not a like a bell has a very distinct frequency. Yeah. Instead of like some really complex wave. Right. Okay. Maybe that's what they mean. All right. So I do you have could a say ringing like a string, <laughs> or ringing like a plate for you flat earthers out there. <laughs> ringing like a chladney plate. <laughs> <laughs> That's why there are waves in the ocean, man. <laughs> okay, so I do have one from MysteriousUniverse.org. Archaeologists are searching for Dead Sea Scrolls in newly found caves. This is by Jocelyn LeBlanc. Archaeologists have found two new caves near... Do it. <laughs> Quirman? <laughs> Qu Quimran. Quimran. In the West Bank that they think may hold some Dead Sea Scrolls. The newly found caves, which are called 53B and 53C are located close to other caves where some scrolls have already been found. <clears throat> I, I kind of like Newfin Caves, like the way you were putting it. <laughs> Newfin Caves. <laughs> Newfin Cave A yeah. and Newfin Cave B. <laughs> the previously found Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 12 caves that were near Quimran and included 900 manuscripts. 12 caves. Yeah. 
Why do they think there are more? Dumb. <laughs> <laughs> It is thought that a group of people called Essenes lived in Qumran <laughs> and that they were the ones who wrote a lot of the scrolls. The Essenes ended up leaving the area around 70 AD when a revolt began against the Romans. The first 11 caves were found between the years 1946 and 1956. Those 11 caves held the majority of the scrolls. The 12th cave, however, was discovered much later in 2017 and only one blank scroll was found inside. The archaeologists did, however, find jars textiles, string, and rope that were used to store the scrolls. By finding the remains of items used to store them, but not finding the actual Dead Sea Scrolls, it would indicate that they were more than likely stolen at some point. So the 12th cave had been looted in antiquity. We've heard this before. Yeah. Didn't bother stealing the blank one. Right. <laughs> this one's blank. Leave it. <laughs> How did they know it was blank? Did they open all the scrolls before they stole them? I know. It's probably that the stuff that was in those scrolls uh, you know, it's the same like the, the you know like oh sorry this cave was looted in antiquity, you know, but they left like all the other artifacts. Yeah, like the gold string that held them together. You know. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> the two new caves that have been recently discovered are close in proximity to the twelfth cave, the cave, and they also contain evidence that indicates the scrolls were indeed there in the past. Unfortunately, archaeologists have yet to find any remaining scrolls, but they still have a lot of investigating to do. Inside of Cave Fifty Three B. Researchers found several artifacts from humans visiting the cave years earlier, which included a bronze cooking pot and an oil lamp. In a paper written by archaeologist Randall Price of Liberty University in Virginia and Oren Gutfeld, Gutfeld of Hebrew University of Jerusalem, they wrote that researchers found, quote, large amounts of pottery representing sto store jars, flasks, cups and cooking pots, and fragments of woven textiles, braided ropes, and string. So that implies that people were living in there, maybe. Or maybe they were maybe. storing more than just scrolls. Maybe that's where they were writing the scrolls. <laughs> <laughs> they had blank scrolls. They had everything they needed. Yeah, clearly this is where the scrolls they were. They had a lamp. Created. Yeah. They were writing the scrolls, and then they were like, too many people know about this scroll writing cave. <laughs> so we need to hide these scrolls in another cave. <laughs> After analyzing the bronze, it could be that they were copying stuff. Yeah. After analyzing the bronze cooking pot, it was determined that it dates back from between 100 B.C., and 15 BC, which is also the same time that people were living at the archaeological site of Quimrin. Also, the oil lamp that was found in the cave looks quite similar to the lamps that were found at Quimrin, which would indicate that the people who inhabited the site more than likely used the caves as well. So in other words, they, they, they date from the same period that people think the scrolls were stored there. So these aren't the looters. You know? Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is, like, what if they suspected that this cave was found out and then they moved them? Yeah, could be. Yep, and there's thousands of caves. In yeah, this whole or maybe area. there's just one paranoid guy who was like, "I don't know. <laughs> we got to move now." Yeah, the Romans have found me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I must move all nine hundred of my scrolls. <laughs> <clears throat> we have not analyzed all the pottery from the cave, so we do not know if a scroll jar was present. But since the rope, string, and textiles found in the cave fifty three B are quite similar to the ones previously found in cave twelve, I think their numbering is off here. Cave 12, and then they go to 53 A and B. <laughs> yeah. Like, what's, what's wrong with you guys? It may have also been used to store the scrolls as well. As for the second newly found cave called 53 C, researchers found a piece of scroll jar, which indicates that scrolls were stored in that cave at one time. They are currently excavating the cave to see if they can find evidence of any hidden scrolls. That's cool. Yeah. And keep an eye out for copper. Yeah. Copper scrolls. Yeah. Come on. Like the yeah. the copper scroll that was found way back behind in some other chamber behind all the Dead Sea scrolls once they got through. Yeah. Like you couldn't even get back there. Right. Because the jars filled the chamber. Right. All those were just to hide the copper scroll. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> they spent all this time in K53A and B writing scrolls to hide the copper scroll. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and the copper scroll was... Basically, a list of treasure. Yeah, that's right. And with with like riddles and clues on where to find it. And they're like, "This is obviously a hoax." <laughs> you know, and you're like, "What? Yeah, what? Uh, <laughs> this is a copper scroll hoax fad." Yeah, that's right. It was a copper scroll hoax fad at some point, thousands of years ago. <laughs> Oh, man. And every time somebody finds something that was, like, mentioned in the Copper Scroll, they're like, no. Yeah. That's not in the same area. That couldn't have been. Yeah. 
it's just they, a coincidence. They wouldn't have known about that because mm-hmm. it's too far away. And you're like, right, how right. do you even know that the people who buried the Dead Sea Scrolls in there knew the Copper Scroll was back there? That's true. Or that they could read the Copper Scroll. Yeah, exactly. Or is it in the same language? I don't even know. What I don't know. I think so, probably. Yeah. But it, it, uh, I just remember there's one place I think that it lists was actually in Giza somewhere. Oh. Uh, I think it might have been one of the places that was listed pretty well describes, uh, I think, one of the pyramids at Saqqara. Mm. Before it was discovered, right? Oh, yeah. And then they find the interest of Saqqara, right? Or one of the pyramids there, which has like the pyramid texts. Yeah. And all that. The pyramid texts at Saqqara. Right. Yeah. But under the, there was like gold and stuff like hidden under the stairs or something in the entryway to the pyramid. Yeah. There was all these gold coins and silver coins. And it was like the same number of coins that the Copper mm. Scroll said. Yeah. And they were like, there's no way they would have even known about that <laughs> place. <laughs> It would just have to be a coincidence or something like I might be getting that wrong. Maybe check it out, watcher. But but it's something like that. Basically. It's something like that. Yeah. I looked. I, I really looked into the Copper Scroll. At, uh, GMA had a, a magazine or something that at the house in town mm. that had a thing about the Copper Scroll, and I was like, what? Yeah. So I just looked into it, and and yeah, there's all these you know treasure seekers and stuff that are like, yeah, Copper Scroll. <laughs> and then all the Skirptards are just like, no, yeah, it's a hoax. They didn't even know about that place where they found all that <laughs> treasure that is exactly listed in that scroll. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and God, then the, and then I the, hate that. And then the other place where we know that this other thing is listed, there was never anything found there. Right, right, of like, course. Okay. Yeah. All right, buddy. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to take a break from those kind of guys. And right now we need to take a break from the show. So we're going to come back in uh, for the second half of the first hour with more snakes. Skirptards think that the only place any of the treasures can be hidden that are listed on the Copper Scroll is Jerusalem. Oh my God! Right? Like th- that's that's <laughs> one of the things I read. Like it's got to be right around Jerusalem. Right. It has to be around the Dead Sea or wherever it was found. Yeah. Right, yeah. Man. So one of the uh, like uh, to me the most fascinating thing that the Copper Scroll lists in its list of treasures is the location of another. Oh, copper yeah. scroll. Yeah. <laughs> God dang <Yes>. it. <laughs> like greatest uh, scavenger hunt of all time. Uh, I know, like, right? Uh, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> Donate to our pyramid scheme, folks, <laughs> so we can find the copper scrolls. That's right. Maybe we should start up a copper scroll scheme. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go to uh, go to the website, brothersoftheserpent.com. Click on the donate button. Yeah. Help us out. Help us out. We got to go find this trick. You guys will get the scoop first. <laughs> the copper scrolls. <laughs> <laughs> so the watcher informed us during the break that the copper scroll is mixed with a tiny amount of tin, which makes it a proto bronze. That's how you make bronze, <laughs> copper and tin. So it'd be really interesting to find out. We were just pointing out that it'd be interesting to find out where does that copper come from? Yeah, so when was the Bronze Age? Uh, in, in reference to, you know, what the idea around the the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. Like that they were. Bronze Age, I I don't know. I would need to look that I'm up. I'm thinking Watch it's later it's, than, than sort of the biblical times. Yeah, well, yeah, bronze was like the, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks used bronze weapons, right? Um, this is previous to. Yeah. The watcher can find it. Okay, so three thousand to 1200 BC. Yeah, so I was I was guessing twelve. Oh, wow, I was guessing yeah, two thousand BC. But yeah, I didn't know. I know. I know nothing. I know nothing. I know so nothing after that is the after dates. that is the Iron Age. But before that, yeah, the Bronze Age is pre-Iron. So when were the day. were the Dead Sea Scrolls actually dated? Like to, as to when they were. Like how old is the they think, papyrus or whatever it is that they, yeah the yeah so seventy A D is when they say the Essenes left the area, 
So they're in the zero. Oh, okay. Yeah. Zero period. So, uh, you know, but but it does, that doesn't matter. Like once you've gotten past a metal age, that metal is still used post bronze age, right? Post bronze, you still have bronze, right? We still have bronze today. So yeah. Uh, so being in the Iron Age, you still have bronze stuff, and it's a lot easier to hammer out a scroll of copper than it is to hammer out a scroll of iron. I think. Right. No, I was just wondering in terms of okay, so if it's almost bronze, was this scroll say before the bronze age or just after and so yeah well so. it's it's it no one knows how old the scroll is right, right. but it, they just assume that it's the same the same date as yeah yeah and i can't remember if it's like you asked the good question is it the same script is it in the same sort of yeah dialect uh, so the watcher says the origin of the dead sea scrolls which were written between 150 bc and 70 ad remains a subject of scholarly debate to this day in other words <laughs> No one's actually sure if the people who stored them there were the people who wrote them. Well, like, right. you know, no one knows, really. And, yeah, and yet they – but but the language itself, they can date it, like, contemporary with other writings that are well dated. Yeah, yeah. The language is known. It's, it's like it's, – it's Semitic, right? Right. Which is a large number of languages, but it's, a, it's Semitic stuff, like Aramaic, Hebrew. Yeah, I'm talking about, say, the, the – uh, Etymology. They, yeah, the they can determine. Yes. yes, yeah. So they can, but that, that's the other thing is like the origin of the texts themselves is unknown. And right. And that a lot of them could be just like the the pyramid texts, which we were talking about, are actually copies of much. And the scribes themselves that wrote this pyramid text said this. They're like, right. we are putting this on here because the texts we have are falling apart. Right. We're, we're going to write it on the wall of the pyramid. Right. Because <laughs> screw this paper stuff. Right. <laughs> The same thing happened at the Edfu building text. What trees were they making that paper out of? <laughs> <laughs> we live in the desert. <laughs> yeah, and the Edfu building texts in Egypt are the same. Like, there's that whole huge complex of Edfu, and all inscribed on the pillars and everything. The walls are just all these crazy uh, texts, and the, the scribes were like, our, our, our scrolls are falling apart, so we're putting the most important parts that we think are important, and some of them we don't even understand anymore. They couldn't even read them. Yeah. Even though they're written in hieroglyphs, they don't know they had lost a lot of the the, the the meanings of some of the hieroglyphs are just lost. So they were just copying them directly onto the Yeah, so the watcher saying that the Dead Sea Scrolls are probably translated versions of even older texts. Well, yeah, I mean a lot of what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls is also in the Enuma Elish in yeah. various different forms, you know. Yeah. Which is Sumerian. Right. So maybe they had a bunch of crumbling Clay tablets, too. I mean, who knows? Yeah. The copper scroll, though, is, I think, I immediately think Metal Library and Solomon and all that right, kind of right, stuff. Right, you know, right. like, I just, I'm like, okay, if anybody's making books out of out of metal, it's Metal Library, right? And I start thinking about Joseph Smith and the metal plates and there's like, right, and right. all over the world, these legends, and then people are finding them and people are like, no, that's not what those are. It's yeah. a scroll, not a book. It's not a library. And those weren't, those treasures weren't found there. And, you know, you're just like, all right. Yeah. Freaking. There aren't any metal pages. What about the <laughs> copper scroll? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That actually has a tiny bit of tin in it. Yeah. Tin, which probably came from Peru. That's right. Probably, copper, which probably, probably came, came from, from Michigan. Mom. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay, so I have some emails here. Uh, fantastic emails. And the first one I'm going to read... You guys, you guys should all be familiar with this guy now, which we are calling now, thanks to Ty, this great name, the Grand Watcher, <laughs> the father of the Watcher, <laughs> Mr. England, the senior, the Grand Watcher. So he asks, um, were the crystallized balls from the bolide you spoke of geodes? And the answer to that is no, they were not geodes. Not in the traditional form, like a gym bubble, a hollow. If you if yeah, the like hollow interior. But if you cut it, you would see the striations or the. It's like a starburst pattern of crystalline growth. Right, you or would formation. see that if you cut it and polished it, you would definitely see the the formation of the crystal, like you do in the in the sides, like the the smooth cut and polished outer edges of the of the geode. Right, you know, not the open center where you actually see the macro crystal, but. In the solid portions of the sides of the geo, where you can see the layers of crystal, those layers I would describe as being lateral as opposed to these layers, which are 
from the inside out, they're yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's a starburst pattern. Like yeah. you can see, just like pssst, all, all the lines yeah. radiate outward from the central point. Whereas yeah. a geode has a hollow bubble inside of it that fills up with macro crystals, right? Isn't that? I don't the, know. The definition of a geode is a it has is to a, have a hollow in the middle. Yeah, huh? it's got to have okay. a hollow in it. Yeah, okay. some even if it's tiny. Watcher. <laughs> Watch out. He's probably right. I mean, that that's mean what I've always thought too. Like but. the slang term for not slang, but the, the non scientific term for them is gym bubble. Okay. Right? So yeah. that's what they are. It's a bubble that has gems in it, yeah. crystals. And if you're in a place that you know of, you know, people find geodes there, just look for cauliflower on the ground. Yeah. If you find cauliflower, yeah. break it. If you find a piece of cauliflower, <laughs> <laughs> smash it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Take it to a diamond saw guy. <laughs> or. You can get some sand and some hemp and rope and 10,000 units. <laughs> <laughs> and you will have a very nicely cut, polished geo. But don't cut too far because you might cut into the rock beneath it. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's happened a lot in ancient times. People cut too far and they cut deeply into the rock below and that just wastes a lot of time. <laughs> we, we, were, we were asking you to, to look, look for a up, geode. What's the definition? Yeah. Does it have to be hollow? Which it probably does. Yeah, probably does. Okay, so next, did you ever see the recent LIDAR images of the South American jungle showing a huge city beneath the trees? Yes. Hell yeah. Yeah. And uh, we talked about that some on one of the shows, and yeah. we were planning we were, on talking We were about planning it. on sending a secret message to China <laughs> saying that their new LIDAR satellite, that there's probably national security threats <laughs> to China to China in that jungle. That's right. So we were hoping they would just LIDAR the whole thing. <laughs> Okay, so the definition of geode is a small cavity in rock lined with crystals or other mineral matter. A rock containing a cavity lined with crystals. Yeah, so it does require that a small cavity is crystal filled. Oh, fine. Gem bubble. Wrong again. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> just means we're I really good today. about this show. That's right. Just means I learned something. Today. Yeah, that's, that's right. Fun. We're really good at being wrong. You on can't this show. learn anything if you're right all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> <laughs> the two things are mutually exclusive. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I mean, other than learning how wrong other people are. But <laughs> <laughs> he says, weren't all languages <laughs> made up? So he's talking about the Aymara. And what they mean by this is that it was constructed. It from was the, engineered. Yes, it was engineered. Like it was constructed from the ground up like, like a computer language. Someone sat down and created it rather than it yeah. like evolving organically. Like they assume all other languages have done. So I, I would say the answer is no. Um, no one's ever made up a language, as far as we know, except for that Aymara. Right, or like computer language. Right. Okay, but, but n not all languages are, are made up. Like, we, not on purpose. In right. Words. They're not engineered. Right. We sort of... They emerge organically, supposedly. Right. Yeah. And then there are some aspects of the language that are made up, like in like scientific terms, you have to name things. Yeah. But scientific terms eventually morph into other things that were never intended to be their meaning. Right. I've wondered about this, so like the confusion of tongues, right? The, the, the confusion of lip or confusion of tongues, the, the babble effect. I've been looking at this. You know, I've, uh, we've, we have talked about this endlessly on this podcast and this whole thing. And like, I just was thinking about this the other day. Like we have this idea of some kind of cataclysm and maybe multiple multiple cataclysms so you know cataclysms that occur again and again and again and eventually this this advanced civilization that we had is completely wiped out and all that's left are small roving bands of almost animalistic people who have it says in a lot of the ancient legends that they had completely forgotten how to even talk right and then someone goes around the planet teaching them how to speak but giving them all different languages on purpose Ah, you see what I'm saying? It 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 completes the scattering effect. So first you have the the cataclysm that knocks down the quote unquote tower, the the, the civilization of humans. Now you have these small tiny bands that are scattered, like because they were a globe trotting civilization, right? right. They were all you over send the world. out like 72 geniuses, right? That all mm. speak these different languages and yeah. you get them to. Or like they just build languages like a computer language, and then they teach people how to talk again because it says they rose the, you know, they brought them like, here, look, here's how to talk, here's how to use an alphabet, here's how to write, here's how to hunt and fish, and they so they yeah. sort of give them civilization again, but they teach them all different languages all around the world, and they also give off different names for themselves. Yeah, and so you end up with this disconnected you know 
I, I don't know. This is the Babel effect. Like, no one can talk to each other after this. Yeah. Because they all have been given different languages instead of giving them a unified one. Why didn't that happen? Why didn't these teachers that went around the world also give everybody the same language? Yeah, I don't know. So, just something I was thinking about. Because they wanted to hurl humans at each other. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> You don't want them to talk to each other for whatever reason. I don't know. Refer to the glossary on the website. <laughs> Hurling humans. <laughs> so, so Enlil could prove that Enki did it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, so next email is from Patrick Hicks. Again, like longtime listener, uh, emailer, and Twitter follower. Thanks, Patrick. So he says, uh, let's see. He says, I just finished number 75. I also happen to be exactly at the part of Fingerprints of the Gods that you guys were discussing, which was super lucky. The thing that blew my mind most from Mexico was the sculpture of the man inside the serpent where it looked like he was operating a machine. Yeah. Yeah. As you guys started discussing processional numbers again, and with the daylight savings time having been brought up over and over, it made me think that perhaps the metric system was just invented as another way of preventing us from seeing these incredible connections all over the universe. And doing magic. <laughs> <laughs> the relationships between things wouldn't change, but the presentation of them and the lack of noticeable number patterns across disciplines would. Like you, like you can't say, well, Osiris was buried around 72 people, but if you convert that to the metric system, that really matches up with all the other numbers. Side note, a Catholic priest is apparently considered the father of the metric system. Anyway, thanks for the show. Another great one. Ah. He was probably a Jesuit. Yeah. Those guys are everywhere doing weird things. <laughs> <laughs> 72 of them were sent out at one point. <laughs> Scramble right. our brains. <laughs> yeah, so Brett, the watcher is saying that uh, the reason the Inky was giving off different names everywhere so that he could that he could tell Ingla, like, but dude, it wasn't me, bro. Some guy That's named what I was saying. Yeah, some dude named Viticocha. It wasn't me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Viticocha. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Inky. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. What else do I got here? Uh, one other article, I think. Yeah, okay. So I wanted to talk about this. This is, uh, so I'm doing research into this other topic that we're going that uh, is going to be coming up on a, a future show and I come across this thing called the Porta Alchemica okay in Rome Italy so you Roma in Roma yeah yeah you might have been around this thing maybe so it's called the Porta Alchemica wait it's, when in Rome when in Rome was I around it <laughs> <laughs> I mean do you recognize this no okay no so <clears throat> this thing is like. Why are you always looking at obelisks? <laughs> <laughs> That's what our boss said to Kyle. <laughs> so, yeah, he was getting mad at me because I was always trying to find obelisks. <laughs> <laughs> just, st 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 I just bail away from the group and go look at an obelisk. <laughs> Stop looking at obelisks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guy. <laughs> look at that obelisk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh,. Basically, the story here is that there was a large, there was a huge, like a, you know, a palatial home. So what they call a, like a, what do they call them? A, a castello or a, uh, it was an enormous, like, you know, wealthy house, right? This huge uh, home and, the, and like it had all these doorways. But there's this legend that this one guy who's like a, a, a f sort of a famous alchemist. Uh, disappeared after passing through this one doorway in this house. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll get into the more the more details later. But he basically disappears and leaves behind nothing but a, a strange manuscript with indecipherable symbols and text on it and some gold dust flakes. Okay, I think these are clues to something else. Okay, but basically the idea, the reason for the gold dust is because this guy is obviously searching for the philosopher's stone, which allows you to turn any uh, any material into gold. And also give you immortality, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So eventually the whole building was torn down, but for whatever reason, they left this one doorway, the portal, the entryway. Okay. Yeah. And now that's all that's there. It's just this one door and it's been turned into this small little park in Rome. And there's just this freaking door there that doesn't go anywhere. That's awesome. Okay. And inscribed around it are these symbols that were apparently on this, uh, on this, mysterious document that was left by this disappearing alchemist because the the person who owned the home wanted to preserve what that guy wrote and he like inscribed them on there and then also put in all these strange little 
uh, inscriptions that are like riddles, basically. And so when they much later when the home was torn down, for whatever reason, they left that portal because it contains this mysterious script. Okay. So, okay, so I'm just going to read this from, it's, this is actually from triposo.com. The alchemical door, also known as the alchemy gate or magic portal, is a monument built between 1678 and 1680 by, well, uh, do it. <laughs> Massapellano Palombara, the Marquis of Pietroforte in his residence, the villa, that's what I was looking for, the word villa Palombara, which was located in the Esquiline Hills near Piazza Vittorio in Rome. <clears throat> This is the only one of five former gates of the villa that remains. There was a lost door on the opposite side dating them to 1680 and four other lost inscriptions on the walls of the mansion inside the villa. So, legends. According to a story collected by the erudite Francesco Cancellarini in 1802, a pilgrim named Stibium was hosted in the villa for a night. That night, the pilgrim, identified later by some as the alchemist Giuseppe Francesco Bori, known as Gio, uh, Giustinanio, I can't even say this. Good Giustiniano Lord. Bono searched the gardens of the villa overnight in search of a mysterious herb capable of concocting gold. Legend held that the next morning he was seen to disappear through ever, forever through a door, but, few, but left behind a few flakes of gold, the fruits of a successful alchemical transmutation. Okay. And a mysterious paper full of puzzling symbols and equations, putatively describing the ingredients and process required. So the watchers just posted a picture of the Porta Alchemica up there. Uh. The marquee had these symbols engraved on the five gates of the villa uh, uh, and on the walls of the mansion, hoping that one day they would actually be translated. Okay. Okay, yeah, that he's... is an upside down pyramid. Yeah, and eye. a right side up pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's both. It's 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 symbol of David too. It's the the pentagram, right? The two triangles. Uh, yes. And that's also the, the male symbol. But in this one, it has like the eye yeah. on the top of the pyramid, except it's upside down. Right. <laughs> <That's cool. clears throat> okay. A second legend holds that between 1678 and 1680, the same Giuseppe Francesco Bori, along with... Uh, Antheasius Kircher and Gian Lorenzo Bernini this designed and built the gate for the Marquis. The Marquis developed a passion for alchemy in 1656 when he visited the alchemical laboratory in Riario Palace, now known as Palazzo Corsini. Patronized by the exiled Queen Cristina of Sweden, the laboratory was supervised by Pietro Antonio Bandiera and had been visited by Bori and Kircher. This tradition holds the gate was built to memorialize a successful alchemical transmutation that occurred in the Riario Palace. It was rumored that Palombara, Bernini, and Kircher were all poisoned on 28th of November 1680, probably by Bori, for having revealed the secret formulas through the inscriptions on the gate. Hmm. <clears throat> Cancellieri published his semi-fanciful account in 1806, including his interpretation of the inscriptions on the Porta Alchimica. His work was published in June 1895 in French by Pietro Bornia as an issue of the periodical L'Initiation. <laughs> okay. The emblem. The, the initiate. <laughs> yeah. L'Initiation. <laughs> right. <laughs> The particular drawing on the pediment of the gate, with two overlapping triangles and Latin inscriptions, recapitulates the title page in the posthumous 1611, uh, 1677 edition, which differed from the title page of the first edition of the alchemical book Aurelium Secalum Redivivium, Re Redivivium by Adrian von Mistnit. Mindstitched? <laughs> Mindstitched. <laughs> Minsicht, I think is how it is. Also known as Matathanus. In 1747, the emblem was used by Wiener von Sonnefels in his Splendor Lucis oder Glanz des Licht. Similarly, the lower part of the emblem by von Minsicht was depicting a centrum in trigono centri, was reproduced in a manuscript. Okay, so anyway, I want to get to the, the signs or the inscriptions. Here we go. This inscriptions. The monument has numerous symbols and inscriptions used in alchemy. The inscriptions are hard to read from the monument itself. Around the circle at the top, <clears throat> it says, quote, the center is in the triangle of the center, unquote. Also, quote, there are three marvels, God and man, mother and virgin, triune and one. The Hebrew inscription, Ruach Elohim, means spirit of God, or spirit of the gods, because Elohim is plural. Beneath it, it says, 
A dragon. Okay, this is the part that made my spider senses tingle, okay? <laughs> my esoterica senses. Your serpy senses. That's right. My serpy senses were tingling here. A dragon guards the entrance of the magic garden of the Hesperides, and without Hercules, Jason would not have tasted of the delights of Colchis. Okay. That Who one... was Jason? I know you told me this before. <laughs> Jason was the guy with the Argonauts who went for the Golden Fleece. Okay. That doesn't tell you much, but no, you need but to read the Legend of the Golden me. Fleece. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's also an alchemical, right? Okay, so there are six sigils on the jams, and each one with its phrase. Now, here we go. So this is planets associated with metals. Here we go, right? Saturn, lead. When in your house black crows give birth to white doves, then you will be called wise. Hmm. That is definitely a riddle, right? Yes. Jupiter and tin. So each one is has a planet and then a, a metal. Uh, metal. And then there's a, a riddle, right? So Jupiter, tin. The diameter of the sphere, the tau in the circle, and the cross of the globe bring no joy to the blind. Flat earthers. Yeah. Mars, iron. He who can burn with water and wash with fire makes a heaven of earth and a precious earth of heaven. I mean, oh, yeah. these are badass riddles, right? That's basically a rocket, right? <laughs> Turn oxygen into liquid. That's right. Burn with water. Yeah, he who could burn with water and wash with fire yeah. makes a heaven of earth and a precious earth of heaven. Yeah. Venus and bronze. If you make the earth fly upside down, with its wings you may convert torrential waters into stone. Wait, what? Say it again. If you make the earth fly upside down, with its wings you may convert torrential waters into stone. Okay. Mercury. And Mercury, right? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have a metal listed because it is a metal. When Azoth and fire whitened Latona, Diana comes unclothed. And then antimony. I, I couldn't even understand that one. What? <laughs> when Azoth and fire whiten Latona, and Latona is capitalized, it's a name. Okay. And then Diana, Diana is also, these are ancient gods okay. and goddesses. Diana comes unclothed. So we have to look up the meaning of what's Diana, what does she represent? Yeah. Latona and who does what does that represent? And then Azoth, I think, is demonic. I think. Don't don't quote me on that. So when th when this and Yeah, how did he know Venus was upside down? Of course. Because Venus is upside down. Good question, watcher. Fantastic. See, this is what I'm saying. These are riddles. Okay. And then antimony. Our dead son lives, returns from the fire a king. And enjoys occult conjugation. On the base, vitriol, quote, It is an occult work of true wisdom to open the earth so that it may generate salvation for the people. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, energy. Yeah. Instead of salvation. Right. Which is, you know, could pretty say, close. Seems, yeah. I mean. uh, and then it says, in another plate now lost was the device, Ville Ianuam Tranado. Recludens eason obtinet locuples velas medie, which says, passing by opening the door of the villa, Jason obtained the rich fleece of Medea. Again, a reference to the golden fleece and Jason. So, on the doorstep, one more. On the doorstep okay. is si sids non is, an ambiguous quasi palindrome, meaning both if you sit, you do not go, and if you do not sit, you go. A palindrome is a, you can flip it flip around it over and it says, says the, same the same thing. thing. Yeah. Cool. C seeds non sis, said backwards, is also C seeds non sis. That's awesome. Yeah. A palindrome. I so, palindrome. So, all this is very Freemasonic. It's these, this is all, all these alchemists that are associated with this, all the name dropping that was happening in the beginning when I was reading that. Like, don't worry about all who those guys are. It's all very much Freemasonry plus alchemy. All these people were, no, like, Nicholas Flamel is, like, friends with these people. Like, the guy who famously, like, even in Harry Potter, they listed Nicholas Flamel as, the, as, as uh, Vol, uh, Dumbledore's friend who made the Philosopher's Stone, right? Yeah. Like, in actual historical, like, there was a guy actually named Nicholas Flamel, and he actually is supposedly made the Philosopher's Stone. Okay, right. so he's a famous alchemist. He was friends with these people. 
So there's this whole sort of weird mythical story about this alchemist who went out into the garden to look for a plant that would turn things into gold. And then when we passed back through the doorway, vanished and left behind nothing but a, a paper with these weird symbols and sayings on it and a few flakes of gold. Right. That's a, obviously yeah. a an apocryphal story. Full of symbols. And then the rest of the symbols are you're supposed to be able to pull the symbols out of that key, the keys out of that story, I think, and plug them into the keys that are on the door and get something. It, it's this. This is this place is an alchemist. another scavenger hunt. Yes, <laughs> this place is also it's it's a it has for hundreds of years been a like a pilgrimage site for alchemists. That's cool. They go there and they look at this doorway, right? So I just wanted you I wanted you guys to think about this, like that whole thing with the planets and the metals. Those are obviously riddles to me. Like this first one really made me like, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> I'm like I want to know what this means. Where it says, when in your house black crows give birth to white doves, then you will be called wise. Yeah, that's that sounds like the the alchemist like goal, right? To to transmutation. Yeah. To turn this thing into another thing, then you become a wizard. Right. right. Basically. Right. And that's but the, okay. What was the other one? There was there was one that I was like, uh, the one with no no joy to the blind. That one. The first one. That one's Saturn and lead, and that you know the whole le- turn lead yeah, into gold, right? Into gold, right. When in your house, black crows give birth to white doves. This full yeah, of symbols. So you can when you turn lead into gold, you're you're a wizard. Yeah, basically, that's <laughs> okay. what it's saying. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Jupiter tin. The diameter of the sphere, the tau in the circle, and the cross of the globe bring no joy. To the blind. Yeah. So, so the like geomancy, geometry, geometry. Yeah. Uh, um, that's like it's it. It reminds me of what Randall Carlson was saying about the mark of the beast. The oh yeah, you know the mark is on your forehead when the numbers it's in your mind. Yeah, the numbers are on your forehead when you know these numbers. Then you begin to see them. You begin to see their symbol symbols everywhere. So to the blind, you know, not necessarily the visually blind, but the person who doesn't have the numbers, yeah. doesn't understand the science, cannot make the connections across the board when they see, when they, when they're looking at nature. Yeah. That's kind of the way I like think of that one. But there was another one that was, that was think I was thinking of, um, he who can metallurgy. burn with water metallurgy. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Mars and iron, he who can burn with water and wash with fire. Makes a heaven of earth and a precious earth of heaven. Yes. Okay. So, so washing with fire is like purifying. It's it's yeah. metallurgy, right? Like you're washing the, the ore, ore with fire, yeah, with fire, and you're you're crystallizing with the water. Mm-hmm. You can burn iron with water. That's true. Yeah. Right. Oxidation, In a way. Yeah. yeah. And remember, yeah. this is Mars iron. Right. You can burn with water and wash with fire. You have to burn and, iron ore to get. And the last part. Makes a heaven out of earth, right? Makes it an awesome place and makes a precious earth of heaven. The so meteorites, the meteorites, of, meteorites of space steel. Stainless steel. Exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, riddle sucks. Next riddle. <laughs> <laughs> if you make the earth fly upside down with its wings, you may convert torrential waters into stone. That sounds like a... Um... Velikovsky talked about... <laughs> Venus being a comet, right? This is Venus and bronze, right? So Venus being a comet, this supposedly happens in the Bronze Age. Venus is actually upside down, and it comes close to Earth, and what does it do? It causes an in- immense eruption of water, which yeah, turns flood. everything into fossils. That's right. Oh, God. Mystery solved. Next mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, look at this. Oh, I need the, this one. Oh, yeah. you blew my socks off. <laughs> <laughs> See, I've got to find these secrets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so that was Mercury. Okay, and Mercury went Azoth. Okay, so the Watcher has Azoth up here. Azoth was oh. considered to be a universal medication or universal solvent and was sought for in alchemy. Similar to another alchemical idealized substance, Alkahest. Azoth was the aim, goal, and vision of many alchemi- alchemical works. Its symbol was the caduceus. Hmm. Mm. Caduceus is the, the serpent. Sta- the serpent with the yeah. Serpents on a staff. Yeah. Yeah. The ac- the actual one that's like yeah the two serpents. Yeah. 
The double helix. It looks like the double helix. Yeah. It's the double helix. So when Azoth and fire. So what's okay? So watcher, what's Latona? L A T O N A. Oh. Does he have it in there? Latona, known as Leto in Greek mythology, was the daughter of the Titan couple Coeus and Phoebe. Uh, Phoebe. 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 She became the mistress of Jupiter and conceived two children by him, Diana, mm, there we go, and Apollo. When she discovered this pregnancy, Juno, Jupiter's wife, was filled with fire. We talked about this. Yeah. Yeah. The two things, like, like we talked about the um, Jupiter birthing these two yeah, bodies, that's right? that's right. Out of its forehead. Out of, yes. Yeah. Zeus. Okay, And there's so, still a storm there. When, yeah. From when, when that thing came out. When Azoth... So this this alchemical substance that was looked for that was what did he say it was a solvent? It was a solvent, right? Azoth was considered to be a universal medication or solvent. Yes. So when Azoth and fire whiten Latona. Okay. So kill her or it whitens her like burns her? That still sounds like metallurgy like or or yeah. or like just think of chemistry. Like when you add when you add something and it ch it it's like electroplating or it's changing the the yeah. chemical makeup of something and it changes its color. Yeah. It also makes me wonder if they're actually, in some ways, talking about this whole cataclysmic event. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Forming of a, a, of a precipitate. precipitate. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So. When Azoth and fire whitens Latona, Diana, which is a daughter, according to the, this myth here, she becomes mistress of Jupiter and conceives two children, Diana and Apollo. Apollo is Apollo is the messenger of the gods. Yeah. He's Hermes. Spaceship. Hermes Trismegistus. He's Thoth to Hody. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, Mercury. Ooh. What? Maybe they're talking about making mercury. Could out be, of, yeah. Precipitate, of, yeah. Uh, precipitate mercury out of uh, Charles. What? What's the? Uh, Dang it! <laughs> what's the ore? Oh, uh, starts with a C. Mm. I was thinking chalcedony, but that's no, a, that's, that's not a, it. a semi-precious stone, I think. Anyways, anyways, yeah. So when Azoth and Fire White and Latona, Diana comes unclothed. Hmm. Cinnabar, cinnabar. That's it. Yeah. And it's red. And that is in Mercury. This is Mercury. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. It's red. And it's like red. And then you whiten it. Mm -hmm. becomes. Yeah. Okay. So Latona is, is the Cinnabar, maybe. When Azoth and Fire whiten Latona, Diana comes unclothed. Uh, right? Could be. Who knows? Maybe, maybe so. Our dead son lives, returns from the fire a king, and enjoys a cult conjugation. That's a weird one. That one's listed under antimony. And on the base, it has... This is the base? No, what was the last one? Vitriol. It is an occult work of true wisdom to open the earth so that it may generate salvation for the people. Yeah, that just... That one sounds like just... Mining or... Yeah. I mean, if we're going on the metallurgy thing. Yeah. Fracking. <laughs> yeah. Opening the earth for salvation of the people. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I guess. All right, so that's cool. I just wanted to go through that. And all right, so I'm telling you, man, when I first read those things, my, all the hairs on my yeah, arms yeah. stood up. I was like, oh my god! All your scales Secrets. stood on end. Right? <laughs> right. All my scales, my snake scales, all stood up on end. <laughs> so, all right, so new thing. Like we we talk about, you know, when the cataclysm comes, be prepared to strike a pose, make an awesome fossil face. You know, for future archaeology, yeah. yeah, become an out of place artifact. Well, <laughs> you know, if you if you are if you're out berry picking in a boulder field, <laughs> you need to bring with you some cryptic book full of all these symbols that no one can understand yes. and a little bit of gold dust in your pocket. <laughs> and when you see that nepha coming to grab you, you just throw it down on the ground and vanish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like you know, get a get a metallurgy book or something and. And translate it into your own you like, strange cryptic language. <laughs> 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 yeah, just like drop the book, throw the gold dust, and you're and, and just like, all right, I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so he's pointing out that you remove mercury from cinnabar by heating it, which creates sulfur dioxide and mercury vapor, and sulfur and, dioxide is white. Ah. Interesting. And then you and then you have to uh, you have to distill the. Right, mercury you have to vapor. precipitate the mercury vapor, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. 
<sighs> wow. Sorry about the coughing. That's really cool. So the, 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 the first part of it, too, um, this dragon part. A dragon guards the entrance of the magic garden of the Hesperides, and without Hercules, Jason would not have tasted the gl- delights of Colchis. So I don't know what that one is because I don't know what. Colchis so what was Hercules' greatest act? Hercules you know? had this. The, was it seven or twelve tasks he was set to do that were impossible? Basically, uh, move giant blocks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can't remember the tasks, but uh, and he was trained in the arts of war by uh, it was twelve, so it was twelve tasks. So it was very processional. Yeah, and he was trained in the arts of war by uh, Chiron, a, a centaur, hmm. an ancient centaur. Chiron trained Hercules or Heracles, as he called him in the arts of war. Heracles is the more ancient Greek name. Um, it sounds it's kind of like the more ancient word is. Nuclear, but the more modern one is nuclear. <laughs> nuclear. <laughs> Heracles and Hercules. God, I wish he would quit saying Hercules. It's freaking Heracles. Damn, it sounds dumb. <laughs> <coughs> All right, folks. Well, there you go. You have a whole segment of us actually on, it, like, in on real time, on the fly. I had no idea what was going to happen when I was reading these out. I was just like, these are weird, and like they made my snake scales all stand up on end. I'm going to read them out on the show, and we just freaking solved them all. So, in real time, folks. 30 minutes. <laughs> That's right. You heard it here first. This is why people visit the Porta Alchemica in Rome, and we're going to take a break. Oh, yeah, and by the way, like when, when you do vanish... You know, mm-hmm. with your with your book and the gold and the, and the gold. When they write about it later, they'll be like, "So Bob was <laughs> in." <laughs> you know, what I mean? yeah. Bob was with Russ. Yeah, in the park. Yeah, and Bob vanished. also sometimes known as Robert. <laughs> yeah. And people in the way in the future be like, "Why is Bob and Ro- <laughs> what? How is this guy also?" She was just like reading all these ridiculous names I and places. Know. It was like, yeah. Uh, (laughs) Russ, who could also have been known as Wallace, perhaps. (laughs) Referred to by some as Snake Bro (laughs) 1. all alchemical mysteries flawlessly <laughs> zero mistakes <laughs> <laughs> brothers of the serpent podcast <laughs> doing it live if it was live yeah <laughs> if it was live it would be it live, would be live. <laughs> <laughs> all right so i have this article that we should change that to zero corrections <laughs> <laughs> yeah there you go zero corrections. we don't we don't solving do- all chemical mysteries flawlessly is zero correction that's right we don't do edits around here right. folks that's right the only time we do an edit is when there's a massive uh technical, technical breakdown yeah that's right like i guess we, what i should say is solving all alchemical mysteries on the fly yeah, yeah zero there you corrections go. <laughs> there you go, there you go. <laughs> that's right because it may not be flawlessly uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not in zero mistakes either so yeah Okay, so I have this article. This is from Wired, <coughs> Wired.com by Shannon Hall. Uh, unexpectedly vanishing quasars are mystifying scientists. Well, they wouldn't be mystifying them if they were expected. <laughs> That's right. So this is, uh, let's see. Stephanie Lam- Lamassa did a double take. She was staring at two images on her computer screen, both of the same object except they looked nothing alike. The first image, captured in 2000 with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, resembled a classic quasar, an extremely bright and distant object powered by a ravenous, supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy. It was blue, with broad peaks of light, but the second image, measured in 2010, was one-tenth of its former brightness and did not exhibit those same peaks. The quasar seemed to have vanished, leaving just another galaxy. 
just, you know, just a galaxy. <laughs> That had to be impossible, she thought. Although quasars do turn off, transitioning into mere galaxies, the process should take 10,000 years or more. This quasar appeared to have shut down in less than 10 years. A cosmic eye blink. La Massa, an astronomer now at the Space Telescope Science Institute, was mystified. Until that moment in 2014, she, like so many others, had expected quasars to be relatively stagnant. Then you see these drastic changes within a human lifetime, and it's pretty cool, she said. <laughs> Confusion turned into excitement, and a hunt began to find more of these oddities. Although less luminous examples had already been seen, astronomers wanted to know if changes as dramatic as the one Lamassa discovered were common. It was no straightforward task, given that surveys tend not to go back and look at objects they have previously observed. Why not? Too much data. Yeah. But. Just guessing. Astronomers searched through archive data and discovered 50 to 100 more of what became known as changing look quasars. Hey, watcher, your mic is still on, buddy. Just letting you know. <laughs> what? <laughs> I've been pinging him over here. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I just kept hearing it, and I was like, well, I might as well say something. <clears throat> Some of these have dimmed substantially more than Lamas's first example. Others have transitioned in the space of a month or two, and others, after disappearing, have reappeared again. What? It's clear that the reason we weren't finding these objects before is that we weren't looking for them said Eric Morganson, an astronomer at the University of Illinois. Of course, you don't look for something, you're probably not going to find it. <laughs> but how could such massive objects, super, lum super luminous beacons generated by solar system scale vortexes of gas and dust swirling into black holes with a mass of millions of suns, shut down so quickly? At first, astronomers refused to believe that they could, instead suggesting that these weren't actually quasars at all, but rather supernovas and flaring stars masquerading as quasars. Or perhaps dust clouds that were temporarily blocking our view. That's what I was going to say. Black bodies. <laughs> yeah. But those ideas have largely failed to match what astronomers see. Within the past year, a number of observations have peered more closely at these systems, providing details that suggest the accretion disk, that swirl of hot matter that encircles the black hole and gives these objects their dazzling luminosity, appears to flicker on and off. In parallel, theoretical astrophysicists have brainstormed how this might happen. It's a little crazy that this whole system, which is just so enormous, is changing that quickly, Morganson said. Black hole doppelgangers. Oh, man. Uh, I've been waiting for this day. Uh. <laughs> I knew this day would come. <laughs> for the last four years, astronomers have attempted to understand changing look quasars using the simplest theories possible. At first, to, that, as long as they fit into the most ridiculous <laughs> theory that they can come up with. That's right. <laughs> at first, that meant finding scenarios that did not require sweeping changes in the accretion disk, because at heart, they're all uniformitarians. Yeah. To understand why, it helps to consider the size of these systems. If you could plop a quasar on top of the solar system, ours, I, I presume, the supermassive black hole would swallow the sun, while the accretion disk would stretch out tens of thousands of times farther than Earth. To turn the quasar off, all of that material would have to swirl inward and fall onto the black hole, a process that calculations and even observations suggest should take tens to hundreds of thousands of years. There's no way that the accretion should be able to shut down as quickly as we've seen it do, said Paul Green, an astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. The physics just doesn't really make sense, he says. <clears throat> so astronomers considered other possibilities. When Lamassa first made her startling discovery in 2014, she postulated that a massive dust cloud passed in front of the quasar's bright beacon and momentarily blocked its light. But when she and her colleagues tried to model that scenario, they found that only an overly complex situation with multiple clouds could reproduce the observations. It seemed far too unlikely. To boot, any change would have taken much longer than a few years. Others considered whether these objects weren't quasars at all. In 2015, Andrea Merloni at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany suggested that perhaps Lamassa's object was actually a star that passed too close to the black hole and was torn apart, creating a bright flare. Similarly, the others have argued that the purported quasars were actually powerful supernovas. Both possibilities would outshine their host galaxies much like quasars and might even emit similar wavelengths of light. Ugh. We can tell one of the reasons we one of the ways they tell quasars apart from novas and supernovas is that they don't emit similar wavelengths of light. It's it's just strange that they're saying that they might emit. You know, they, maybe they could. That's what they're saying. 
Then the light from these events would fade over the course of a few months to years, thus matching the time scale but behind changing look quasars. But the problem was that the light would also fade with a particular signature, one that the astronomers did not see. <clears throat> so, researchers have ter recently turned back to quasars. They've been helped by several new studies that have explored the swirling disk of matter itself. In 2017, Zinfen Sheng, Zinfeng Sheng, an astronomer at the University of Science and Technology of China, and his colleagues examined multiple changing look quasars in both visible and infrared light. Those wavelengths allowed the team to view not only each quasar's accretion disk, but also its torus, the donate sh donut <laughs> donate the donut <laughs> donate to our pyramid scheme, the donut-shaped <laughs> ring of dust <laughs> of dust clouds that wraps around the accretion disk. <clears throat> That's important because the glowing accretion disk sends visible light towards the dark torus, where it is absorbed and re-emitted as infrared light. Because of this, any change in the accretion disk will later be echoed within the torus. Sheng and his colleagues saw just such an echo, as did other studies, allowing them to conclude that it must be a sign of a change in the amount of material flowing through the accretion disk. Just how this sweeping change occurs is still a matter of debate, but many hypotheses have recently emerged. Could it be that a quasar does not have to clear its plate completely in order to shut down? This is exactly what I thought. Like, like the accretion disk can become stable for a little while before more material from the interior ring of the disk begins to uh, spiral into the black hole again, and that starts the quasar back up, right? Okay. But the disk itself can become stable. In other words, it all has a stable orbit, and it just rotates around like a record on a platter. Nothing falling inward, just spinning. Like a, what's happening in our solar system right now. Yes. Yeah. Nothing's falling into the sun right now. Right. <clears throat> Everything's fairly stable. Right. And then there's some nearby supernova or nova begin like sends a, a ripple through the accretion disk and matter begins to again fall into the interior, starts the quasar. Okay, backup. so can you describe basically what a quasar is again? Okay. Because yeah, according not... to the standard model, a quasar is powered by a quote-unquote supermassive black hole, which has the mass of millions of sun of our suns. Okay, so it's an in, it's not big; it's just massive, right? It's a black hole that has millions of solar masses, so that makes its gravity gradient incredibly powerful. And then, like any black hole, has an accretion disk around it, right. which is material that is being crushed by the black hole into smaller and smaller bits as it gets closer to the event horizon. And then anything falling into the event horizon is actually crushed on the subatomic level. So it's called a total conversion. All that matter is completely converted into energy, most of which is sucked into the black hole, but some of which spirals upwards because of the spin and ends up coming out as jets on the north and um, south pole yeah. of the black hole. That's the quasar that we see are these enormous jets of light of energy. Okay. Be being caused by the total conversion of matter from the accretion disk falling through the event horizon into energy. Right. So, so the, in my brain, I'm I'm translating energy into basically vibration. Vibration of light, yeah. So some kind of light. Whatever frequency, <clears throat> right? If it's ridiculously high frequency, it's light. Yeah. Uh, or radiation, you know, into gamma rays and all this. Yeah. Everything from all the way up at the gamma radio down spectrum. to infrared. Yeah. yeah. The, the whole electromagnetic spectrum yes. basically is is the, the way I look at it. Like. So if you're taking matter and you're crushing it all up until all you've got is, according to the standard model, the photons that are being released, yeah. which are wave fronts of energy, vibration. Right. Carrying their own medium with them. Right. Exactly. <laughs> They're coming out of the poles, basically seeking the path of least resistance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they're following basically. I mean, the theory is that there, there's some kind of there's a magnetic field associated with the, the black hole, right? So the reason they're shooting out of the poles is because of this. Yes. Yeah. So th that's what a quasar is, is, a, is, is a, a polar jets of massive amounts of photonic or right. electromagnetic energy caused by the total conversion of mass into energy due to the incredible tidal forces at the point of the event horizon of the supermassive black right. hole that powers the quasar. Right. So all the stuff in the accretion disk can, at the outside edges is going to be stars and gigantic bodies. But as you go further and further inward, it gets crushed into tiny bits until you've got nothing but like dust and, and tiny little particles and just sing. And then in the very smallest parts, bits of atoms. Yeah. Right before they fall in and get torn apart completely. Right. So the so the disk turbine pump. Yeah. 
uh, disc like turbine when, pump. Yes, it's a pump, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a turbine yeah. uh, or a pump, yeah. whichever, depending on how you're you're yeah. using it. If you're spinning these this disc and you're and you're putting water into, like say the disc is inside a container, yeah, and you're putting water into the edge of the disc, it's hauling ass, yeah, and it it goes towards the center of the disc as you continue to to supply more water in, yeah. And so by the time it gets to the center, it's moving really fast and yeah. it, it goes out the poles basically. Yes. Like that's the path of least resistance basically. I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 And it's got angular momentum because yes. of the spinning. Okay. I got, I got you. Yeah. It's just interesting that like the accretion disc is happening at the, at the, what would be the equatorial regions of the black hole. Right. And somehow, as it passes into, like, the equatorial regions is the farthest you can get from any pole point, right? Right. And but yet it's, it's able being, to skate across the event horizon. If the black hole idea is correct, right? Right, right. Let's I'm saying say, standard model idea. Let's say that, that it is being pulled into the center, right? Oh, you mean it's jetting out past? Okay. Going through, That's right. Because Because the path of least resistance to get out is going to be at the poles. Yeah. Because so much is being pushed in, or, you know, I'm saying pushed in. I'm going <laughs> elastic universe here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so much is being pushed in at the at the equator. Yeah, that what's contained in the center has to come out, right? And if it's if it's but you're total, talking about within the event horizon. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, inside. Yeah. Okay. Because the standard model says that nothing can escape right, the event horizon. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I'm not saying that. That's why I'm I'm pointing out the weird thing about their idea is that this stuff is happening at the at the equator. But it's and, skating and yet, over, skating over the event horizon and escaping a, at the in, pole, like in a spherical. Yeah. In these flow manner. lines. Yeah. <clears throat> Very strange. Why would it do that? Yeah. Yeah. Because that see that doesn't make any sense because if you have to. If you're going to change your direction, if you, you've got angular momentum, you mm -hmm. know that once you're spinning a, a gyroscope, it's hard to change the polar direction, right? Yeah. So you would have to imagine that the that the matter spinning around that equ equatorial area would have to convert so much of its angular momentum in order to go upward or downward towards a pole. Right. It doesn't make any That's sense. A, yeah. It would never do that. Or, yeah. uh, well, it might. But yeah, it just doesn't seem right. Some else, other strange physics are happening there, right? But if you could, if you could imagine that, let's say it could escape from inside the event horizon, and there's a collection, or the, it's high pressure in there because so much is being forced in. Yeah, that it's high pressure, no matter what. It's yeah, being crushed. Yeah, right. So the easiest path to to escape is going to be directly straight up and down out yeah. of the poles. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, Keep so going. one way to understand this is to break up the accretion disk into separate parts, a bright inner region that illuminates the outer dull region. Then if the black hole consumes the inner region, a process that could occur in mere months, the inner disk will disappear, and without its bright beacon, the outer disk will grow dark, much like the death of the sun would cause the moon to lose its shine. Wow. Really, guys? <laughs> Thanks. We kind of thought these were just hungry guys at a buffet, Morganson said. If there is just an infinite amount of food in front of them, they were just going to keep eating as fast as they could, and then they would remain relatively stable in terms of, like, they would just be eating everything and it would yeah. be constantly bright. But instead we find that they're just taking breaks when the food is still there. Or it could be that the accretion disk changes its shape. It sounds wild, but this year studies of two different quasars found evidence to support this theory based on another echo. In each, the ultraviolet and blue colors fell away first, followed by the green, and then finally the red. That sequence flows from highest energy colors to lowest energy colors. It therefore resembles changes that ripple from inner disk to outer. Something is causing the accretion disk to dim from the inside out, said Barry McKernan, an astrophysicist at the American Museum of Natural History. Because the colors don't completely disappear, the researchers don't suspect that the inner accretion disk was completely swallowed by the black hole. Instead, they think that a cooling front swept out from the supermassive black hole at an incredible clip. The red colors, for example, dropped merely a year after the green colors. That speed is important, McKernan noted, because it can reveal hints about the structure of the disk. If the disk is viscous and turbulent, then it's fairly easy to send information through it. Just think about the fact that sound travels faster in water than in air. So, McKernan argues that the disk must th be viscous and therefore fairly puffed up, a donut, not a DVD, before collapsing into a thin disk once the cool passes, the cool front passes through. Okay. Okay. So, in other words, when it's warm... Low it's, energy. When it's warm, it's puffed up like a donut. 
And when it cools right. down, it flattens back out. Right. That's what they're saying, I think. Yeah, so so high energy, it expands. Low energy, it contracts, basically. The second hypothesis suggests just the opposite. The accretion disk starts thin before puffing up. This is precisely what astronomers think occurs when stellar mass black holes, supermassive black holes, lower mass doppelgangers turn inactive. When they're accreting a lot of mass onto the black hole, their accretion disk is quite thin and luminous. But when that accretion rate drops, the disk puffs up into a quasi-spherical structure that it struggles to emit light. <clears throat> uh, Hirofumi Noda from Tohoku University in Japan and Chris Dunn from Durham University in England wanted to see if such a puffing up could also be responsible for changing look quasars. So this year, they applied their models for the accretion disks around stellar mass black holes to those around supermassive black holes. They found that this change could happen in a quasar's accretion disk and fast, though not as fast as in mere decades. Astronomers can't yet say if the supermassive black hole has been starved, if the disk itself has shape-shifted, either puffing up or caving in, or if an entirely different mechanism is responsible. It's still unclear how gas in the accretion disk flows from an orbit at a large radius to one near the black hole and how it finally falls onto the black hole. And other factors, magnetic fields, for example, likely play a crucial role that astronomers don't yet understand. It is a failure of our imagination, said Meg Uri, an astrophysicist at Yale. While the details remain hazy, a better understanding of how gas and dust flow onto a black hole will do more than answer our sheer curiosity will help explain how galaxies evolve. Nearly 20 years ago, astronomers discovered that the mass of a supermassive black hole is tightly correlated with the mass of the entire galaxy around it. Okay. In fact, the black hole actually truncates a galaxy's growth, causing it to be 10 to 100 times smaller than simulations predict. The gravitational sphere of influence of a black hole is tiny in comparison to an entire galaxy, says John Ruan, an astrophysicist at McGill University. So why is there such a close relationship between the two? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> when the correlation was first discovered, the answer to that question was a mystery, but astronomers now suspect that quasars can wreak havoc on their host galaxy, and the effects are surprisingly far-reaching. A quasar's extreme wind drives dust and gas outside the galaxy. Its extreme luminosity heats any leftover gas to such high temperatures that new stars can't form. It effects, effectively starves both itself and its host galaxy of the stars required to stay alive in a quote-unquote murder-suicide pact, said Gordon Richards, a physicist at Drexel University. At least that's the current thinking. It has been extremely hard to pin down the details because astronomers can't observe a distant quasar and its galaxy simultaneously. The quasar is too bright to see the galaxy at all. Wow. If astronomers could set up cosmic experiments, however, they would study a quasar and then turn off the switch, causing it to grow dark. Changing look quasars are precisely this experiment, Ruan said, offering an unprecedented opportunity to better, under, better understand a quasar's far-reaching effects. Hmm. Chris Dunn is like, what was guiding the quasar? <laughs> you know? <laughs> He's like, yeah. I wonder if he... I don't know. Anyway... It's just funny that guy's name is Chris Dunn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's D O N E though, like done. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. like as in I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. done with this quasar thing. Still, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Couldn't help it. Yeah, <laughs> you don't just like back up and say that looks like a quasar. So I can hear, <laughs> I can hear Brenner already. Like right when you started this whole deal, it's like Electric Universe. Yeah, you know, it's turning them on, turning them off. I mean, yeah, this sounds like. You know, Velikovsky, uh, uh, ah, I can't think of the, the physicist for Electric Universe. What is his Walter name? Walter Thornhill? Yeah, Thornhill. Like these massive <laughs> filaments of plasma or whatever, and then something in the in the network, you know, there, there's all, like, like think about the, the little plasma ball, you know, it's got all the little lightning bolts, like, moving around at a fairly regular yeah and you put your finger up there and it just changes every it changes the whole pattern yeah the other thing i was thinking of was elastic universe in that when we were doing the the experimental model in here a long time ago with the watcher and we were seeing the secondary waves right so you have the the big wave pattern in the entire in the medium yep the secondary waves are pulsing outwards from the the node yeah where all the materials gathered and that would push the accretion disk away from the quasar briefly before it came back. Okay. What do you think of that? Yeah. And that would happen quickly, right? So if, if, there's, if there's a big wave field, <clears throat> the black hole represents a super, a super node, basically, 
right? Yeah. So all this material is gathered there and everything's being pushed towards it. Well, the, there would be secondary waves pulsing outwards from right. it, pushing the accretion disk away from it briefly, and it would turn off and turn on, turn off yeah. and turn on. I kind of see the two things, like when I, when I think of uh, plasma streams in terms of the electric universe, I, I see it in the same way as the as the the overall structure of waves in the universe like you there there would be and everything in terms of path of least resistance so like the the nodal lines yeah it would be the pa plasma are, stream is the plasma stream that's yeah, the path yeah i agree of, with path that too of least resistance. like on the chelatney plate you get these lines of sand yes and that would be the lines and that's of the plasma. nodal line and that's where all the matter collects and all yeah. that stuff so it's the same I agree with you. It's the same deal, but I'm, I'm imagining like the like the the way larger than just that quasar, like you yeah. know, all across the superstructure stuff. Yeah, superstructure. Yeah. So something, you know, it, it's very regular, but then occasionally something happens, and the nodal line just drifts. Yeah. For a moment. Yeah, and the quasar it drifts goes, over yeah. here, and then it drifts back, maybe due to a macro or, or a, a rogue secondary wave. wave. Yeah, or rogue waves. Yeah. Yeah. It I drifts just, for a moment and then drifts back. So. To us, it's, you know, over a period of years, we see it sort of shut off in various frequencies of light. Yeah. Because it's, you know, I, the first theory that they had on the, on the puffing up and contracting sounds more correct to me than the other one. Yeah. The other one just is like squashing it into the <laughs> house of cards of the standard model. Yeah. I don't know. <clears throat> the yeah. whole thing kind of sounds like that. But. Right. They're looking at it within the, within the standard model, and trying yeah. to trying to to figure out what's going on here. Yeah, you know. And to me, I'm like, as soon as I read it, I'm like, okay, I can see this in Elastic Universe easily. Yeah. Uh, even just the, just looking at the quasar by itself, without considering the entire universal structure all around it, that this could happen easily with a quasar. With that a there secondary would be, there wave, would be secondary yeah. waves, right? Yeah. Uh, of course, secondary waves. What? Uh, of course, secondary waves are caused by multi That's massive what I'm structures like the, in the macro. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like looking at any collection of. Of the the dust on the Chaladni plate, and what might happen to it, you have to right realize. Otherwise, that, you're gonna be like, "What is going on here?" Right. Yeah, exactly. You <laughs> have to see the whole thing to understand. Like, okay, there are these these larger motions that are passing. Yeah, and so that's why this minute area that I'm looking at changes suddenly. Right. But even if you just have the basic idea that there are immense motions in in the ethereal or etheric medium. medium then you can just look at the quasar, understanding that, and see the secondary waves, right. knowing that those are happening because of these immense motions in the etheric medium, and that these secondary waves are pushing the accretion disk away from the node briefly. Right. You know. Right. And I think I think the the uh, disappearance of the certain frequencies down or or up the frequency scale. I can't remember which way. It was no, it going. started at the brightest stuff. Yeah, and brightest went down, going yeah. down. Like that's a clue, you yeah. know, as yeah. to as to what. What type of change is happening? Yeah. Um, yeah, because you can't explain that in terms of matter being destroyed because it just will make all kinds of light. Like right. like anything, that, total conversion basically is every light. It's just going to be a huge burst of every kind of frequency there is. Right. So they describe high energy as being, high energy is... is Gamma rays. Is higher frequency vibration, yes, right? Yeah. It's, it takes it's, higher. Always, it's always spoken of in that way. So if you're... You're playing the lowest note on the instrument, that's low energy. And then you play the highest note, it's high energy. Right. And uh, I think Uncle Tom was saying that it, it takes, like to like when you're playing a horn or whatever, hmm. to hit the low note doesn't- takes more air. <laughs> right. Well, the low note doesn't require near the, the, the energy of vibration in terms of uh, decibel. Yeah. But when you want to hit that high note, it's, you know. Yeah. And it requires more energetic. More pressure. Like, so just, <coughs> just purely in astrophysics or just physics per period, to make higher energy or higher frequency light requires highly, higher energetic reactions. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like right now, you're putting out infrared. And you're, you know. But oh, if I set no, you on okay. fire, you would be putting I, out a lot more light than infrared. <laughs> okay, I got, the story, I got the story wrong. It was Nate, our cousin Nate. Tom's son, he was talking about the guitar string and th that like to hit the same note with a low string as, as the high string, you have to, you have to crank up the, 
the oh, tension yeah. on that note yeah, yeah. so much. And so there's so much mass there, okay? So when you when you strum the low string, there's so much mass you're having to move. Yeah. So if you want to bring it up to get to that higher note, it requires so much more energy. Yeah. That's why they make the string smaller. Right. Because it's less mass. Yeah. So you don't have so to you tighten get, it so much. Right. Yeah. So you're, you're getting the higher energy, but it's so much less mass that it's rare, basically equivalent to decibel level yeah. as the decibel level of the low string, which is much higher mass. Yeah. Equivalent energy. Yes. So that, that was a really good way for me to understand the high energy vibration. Yeah. I you see know, you high mean, frequency yeah. versus low energy, low frequency. Right. But the way they... So, so just looking at it in, in those terms, like the, that the high energy, high frequency light starts to go away first. Yeah. It's like the other thing about these, the, the lower energy light or lower energy vibration is that to me, like in terms of music, I always see those as like more stable and I don't, I don't know if but that's the lower energy vibrations. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're well, there's more mass that makes more it more mass, stable. Exactly. Yeah. The more more mass in that big string makes it have makes it more stable of a vibration because it will it'll, it'll last longer. Like it yeah. attenuates slower because it's got more mass, right? So yeah. It's, exactly. The higher string will. Fade so I'm wondering if that correlates to the to the light frequency. <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just all I'm saying is like the reason they call it high energy when you're because because to get those frequencies of light requires generally, like there may be some kind of. Um, synthetic way to make those high frequencies of light without re requiring massive energetic reactions but when you're looking out in space like a like when a supernova goes off that's when you get gamma rays you don't yeah, get yeah, gamma yeah. rays when it's just a star even though the star is like massive energy all kinds of stuff it's putting out a whole bunch of different frequencies of light but to get gamma you gotta it has to explode but it's probably in the, in the same respect like it, you can get this ridiculously high frequency but it's going to be um like if you're putting the same amount of energy in to get this really high frequency as you are to get this low frequency, you're going to get from the low frequency more lumens. Yeah. Brighter. Right. With the same amount of energy as if you got the high frequency, it would be so much. It would be dimmer. dim. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe the gamma just fade. We can't see it. The low, the low frequency, high energy or the low frequency, high energy light is, is blinding us to the low energy, high frequency light of. Possibly. Yeah. 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 So that's why it shuts down first. Like, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> I'm not sure it didn't make sense to me. <laughs> Where so, are we, by the way, on the time? I, um, I'm confused here. We're good. Okay. Oh, wait. No. We're, we are over because I forgot to set it. Okay. All right. So we'll take a quick break. Yep. And come back for the last segment of the show. <laughs> Zero overruns. Oh yeah. Oh, let me let me start the timer. Yeah, let's start the timer there. <laughs> See? See? Zero See, it's, overruns. It's the advancement of science right here. We're <laughs> correcting mistakes. Zero mistakes. So I'm sure all of you have been waiting for this um, geological eras and periods. See, I, I have this table that I've been like I always wanted to know this and I was doing I was looking through Michael Cremo's book uh, Hidden History of the Human Race which is a an abridged version of his fantastic book Forbidden Archaeology which you can get Hidden History of the Human Race on Kindle for nine bucks ten dollars basically but fantastic in this book. table 1.1 1 .1, geological eras and periods right so like because you always see this like they're listening off you know oh yeah in the D Devonian era blah 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 and like I'm like when is this right so the eras are Cenozoic. That's where we are. Okay, Mesozoic and Paleozoic. That's pretty. That's pretty easy to remember. Paleo being the oldest. You know, Meso, Meso is middle, and then we're Ceno. in the Cenozoic. Okay? okay, those are the geological eras. 
Paleozoic ends at 286 million years ago, right? Or you would say the Mesozoic begins there, right? Yeah. Uh, is that how to read this? Let's see. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so uh, Holocene is – these are periods. There's a whole bunch of these. Holocene is what we're in now. Pleistocene, Pliocene, Miocene, Oligocene, Eocene, Paleocene, Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, Permian, Carboniferous, Devonian, Silurian, Ordovician, and Cambrian. Those are the – Too many. Yes, too many. But I we can't, I can't even get the, the zodiacal <laughs> constellations down yet. It's only 12. <laughs> Well, we've, we know the Cambrian because of the Cambrian explosion. Yep. Right. No, I recognize the names, but I'm not going to be able to put them in order. Yeah. Then there's the Permian extinction, right? The Permian period is 286 million years ago. Again, that's the end of the Paleozoic. So the Paleozoic, is an, it, it ends with, a, with a, an extinction event. Yeah. Same thing with the other ones. Like they... they st- ends with a bang. Yeah. Ends yeah. with a bang. So those are the ones... And the periods are... Like it has all the numbers. Anyway, in the book, there's this, peri- this table. And I was like, ah, oh, this is fantastic, but I'm never going to remember it. Uh, but, okay, so he says, paleoanthropologists believe that anatomically modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, emerged gradually from Homo erectus somewhere around 300 to 400,000 years ago. The first early Homo sapiens or archaic Homo sapiens are said to have appeared. They are described as having a cranial capacity almost as large as that as modern humans, yet still manifesting to a lesser degree some of the characteristics of Homo erectus, such as the thick skull, receding forehead, and large brow ridges. Examples of this category are the finds from Swasscombe in England, Steinheim in Germany, and Fonchelved in Otago in France. Because these skulls also possess, to some degree, Neanderthal characteristics, they are also classified as pre-Neanderthal types. Most authorities now postulate that both anatomically modern humans and the classic Western European Neanderthals evolved from a pre-Neanderthal or early Homo sapiens type of hominids. Okay, so... We've also talked about most of that, like 300 to 400,000 years is approximately when Humpo Sape Sape showed up on the scene, according to the standard model. Yeah. Right. Uh, so he goes through a bunch more of this, but this is really the part I wanted to get into for the beginning of this, because I kind of want to go through a bunch of the stuff he has in this book on part one. Part one of this book is about the problems with the standard model discoveries, okay. specifically dealing with the evolution of humans, right? Because this this idea kind of explodes onto the scene in the Darwinian period, and people just like loved it, and yes. they went out looking for evidence of it, and a lot of people were maybe not not so much hoaxing or fabricating the evidence, but being sloppy yeah. in the science to the point to where if you find something anomalous today, if you were that sloppy, they would just freaking ridicule you and drop it. Okay, yeah. that's the point that he gets to in this book that I want to get to. But right here, he has this some principles of epistemology. Before beginning our survey of rejected and accepted paleoanthropological evidence, we shall outline a few epistemological rules that we have tried to follow. Epistemology is defined in Webster's New World Dictionary as the study or theory of the origin, nature, methods, and limits of knowledge. Mm. Okay. So epistemology is the study of knowledge and how we accumulate it, basically. That's cool. Yeah. When engaged in the study of scientific evidence, it is important to keep the nature, methods, and limits of knowledge in mind. Otherwise, one is prone to fall into illusion. Paleoanthropological evidence has certain key limitations that should be pointed out. First, the observations that go into paleoanthropological facts tend to involve rare discoveries that cannot be duplicated at will. Which is pretty obvious, right? For example, some scientists in this field have built great reputations on the basis of a few famous discoveries, and others, the vast majority, have spent their entire careers without making a single significant find. Second, once a discovery is made, key elements of the evidence are destroyed. And knowledge of these elements depends solely on the testimony of the discoverers. For example, one of the most important aspects of a fossil is its stratigraphic position. Where it is in the strata. However, once the fossil is removed from the earth, the direct evidence indicating its position is destroyed. And we simply have to depend on the excavator's testimony as to where he or she found it. Of course, one may argue that chemical or other features of the fossil may indicate its place of origin. This is true in some cases, but not in others. And in making such judgments, we also have to depend on reports concerning the chemical and other physical properties of the strata in which the fossil was allegedly found. Persons... Making important discoveries sometimes cannot find their way back to the sites of those discoveries. <laughs> I know this. This yes. has happened to me before plenty of times. <laughs> I found this. It's badass. It's around here somewhere. I promise. <laughs> Hours later, I, it's, 
It's right over here. I can... <laughs> <laughs> After a few years, the sites are almost inevitably destroyed, perhaps by erosion, by complete paleoanthropological excavation, or by commercial developments involving quarrying, building construction, and so forth. Even modern excavations involving meticulous recording of details destroy the very evidence they are recording, leaving one with nothing but written testimony to back up many key assertions. And many important discoveries even today involve very scanty recording of key details. Right? It's yeah. one of our main complaints on this stuff. Thus, a person desiring to verify paleoanthropological reports will find it very difficult to gain access to the real facts, even if he or she is able to travel to the site of a discovery. And, of course... Limitations of time and money make it impossible to personally examine more than a small percentage of the totality of important paleoanthropological sites. A third problem is that the facts is that the facts of paleoanthropology are seldom, if ever, simple. A scientist may testify that the fossils were clearly weathering out of a certain early Pleistocene layer, but this apparently simple statement may depend on many observations and arguments involving geological faulting, the possibility of slumping, the presence or absence of a layer of hill wash, the presence of a refilled gully, and so on. If one consults the testimony of another person present at the site, one may find that he or she discusses many important details not mentioned by the first witness. Yeah. Different observers sometimes contradict one another, and their senses and memories are imperfect. Thus, an observer at a given site may see certain things, but miss other important things. Some of these things might be seen by other observers, but this could turn out to be impossible because the site has become inaccessible. Then there is the problem of cheating. This can occur on the level of systematic fraud, as in the Piltdown case. As we shall see, to get to the bottom of this kind of cheating, one requires the investigative abilities of a super Sherlock Holmes plus all the facilities of a modern forensic laborator uh, laboratory. Unfortunately, there are always strong motives for deliberate or unconscious fraud, since fame and glory await the person who succeeds in finding a human ancestor. Cheating can also occur on the level of simply omitting to report observations that do not agree with one's desired conclusions. As we shall see in the course of this book, investigators have sometimes observed artifacts in certain strata, but never reported this because they did not believe the artifacts could possibly be of that age. It is very difficult to avoid this because our senses are imperfect, and if we see something that seems impossible, then it is natural to suppose that we may be mistaken. Indeed, this may very well be the case. Cheating by neglecting to mention important observations is simply a limitation of human nature that unfortunately can have a de de deleterious, imp deleterious, yeah. deleterious impact on the empirical process. The drawbacks of paleoanthropological facts are not limited to excavations of objects. Similar drawbacks are also found in modern chemical or radiometric dating studies. For example, a carbon-14 date might seem to have involved a straightforward procedure that reliably yields a number, the age of an object. But actual dating studies often turn out to involve complex considerations regarding the identity of samples and their history and possible contamination. They may involve the rejection of some preliminary calculated dates and the acceptance of others on the basis of complex arguments that are seldom explicitly published. Here are also the facts can be complex, incomplete, and largely inaccessible. In other words, like they'll they'll do dating multiple times, get a vast num majority of num or a vast a wide range of numbers and then use all kinds of complex logical arguments or pseudo-logical arguments in order to get the one that they want, right? Yes. This happens quite often. Calibrated. Yeah, it's calibrated to be the number that we want. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the conclusion we draw from these limitations of paleoanthropological facts is that in this field of study, we are largely limited to the comparative study of reports. Although hard evidence does exist in the form of fossils and artifacts in museums, most of the key evidence that gives importance to these objects exists only in written form. Since the information conveyed by paleoanthropological reports tends to be incomplete, and since even the simplest paleoanthropological facts tend to involve complex, unresolvable issues, it is difficult to arrive at solid conclusions about the reality in this field. What then can we do? We suggest that one important thing we can do is compare the quality of different reports. Although we do not have access to the real facts, we can directly study different reports and objectively compare them. A collection of reports dealing with certain discoveries can be evaluated on the basis of the thoroughness of the reported investigation and the logic and consistency of the arguments presented. One can consider whether or not various skeptical counter-arguments to a given theory have been raised and answered. Since reported observations must always be taken on faith in some respect, one can also inquire into the qualifications of the observers. We propose that if two collections of reports appear to be equally reliable on the basis of these criteria, then they should be treated equally. Both sets might be accepted, both might be rejected, or both might be regarded as having an uncertain status. 
It would be wrong, however, to accept one set of accept one set of reports while rejecting the other, and it would be especially wrong to accept one set as proof of a given theory while suppressing the other set, thus rendering it inaccessible to future students. Yeah. We apply this approach to two particular sets of reports. The first set consists of reports of anomalously old artifacts and human skeletal remains, most of which were discovered in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. These reports are discussed in part one of this book. The second set consists of reports of artifacts and skeletal remains that are accepted as evidence in support of current theories of human evolution. These reports range in date from the late 19th century to the, late, to the 1980s, and they are discussed in part two. Due to the na uh, natural interconnections between the different discoveries, some anomalous discoveries are also discussed in part two. Our thesis is that in spite of the various advances in paleoanthropological science in the 20th century, there is an essential equivalence in equality in quality between these two sets of reports. We therefore suggest that it is not appropriate to accept the one set and reject the other. Yeah. This has serious implications for the modern theory of human evolution. If we reject the first set of reports, which are the anomalies, and to be consistent, also reject the second set, evidence currently accepted, then the theory of human evolution is deprived of a good part of its observational foundation. But if we accept the first set of reports, then we must accept the existence of intelligent, tool-making beings in geological periods as remote as the Miocene or even the Eocene. If we accept the skeletal evidence presented in these reports, we must go further and accept the existence of anatomically modern human beings in, this remote, in these remote periods. This is not only contradicts the modern theory of human evolution, but it also casts grave doubt on our entire picture of the evolution of mammalian life in the Cenozoic era. Yeah. God dang it, that book is so pretty <laughs> awesome. I love that book. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, one of the biggest, uh, scurpturps of this book is that they claim that he has a Hindu bias. You know about this? No. So Michael Cremo is basically a, a Hindu, follows a type of Hindu or Buddhist religion. Okay. That's his spirituality, right? Yeah. He is eminently a research guy. He's, I don't know if you'd call him a scientist. He doesn't go out in the field or whatever, but he is like, like a freaking library nerd, right? Yeah. Okay. Deep research dude. Uh, Hindu or Buddhist f uh, theology does propose that humans have been around for millions and millions and millions of years. Okay. Like you have, you have the, of the whole... Uh, the whole day of Brahma, which is about the age of the earth as it currently ac accepted as by science for something like 400, 4 billion, 320 million years. Basically it's a processional number, right? Four, three, two, zero, 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 right? Four billion, one day of Brahma is like 4 billion, 332 or 320 million years or whatever. In the, in their idea, humans have been around for almost the entire time because we're we're products of the Brahmin thought experiment or whatever it is. That they okay. I, I don't know the theology, but basically, they they believe that humans have been here for millions for the, the entire age of the earth, right? As so long they're as accusing him of confirmation bias. Basically, they're accusing him of being biased. That the whole book is just about his bias that we've been here for millions of years. Right. That's why he digs up these anomalies that show that. That, that, that humans have been around for 320 million years or whatever, yeah. you know, the guy under Tabletop Mountain that was 320 million years old, right? My problem with that, and I, I don't know if we've talked about this before or not, but like the, 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 the unspoken implication in that accusation is that uh, atheists or people that don't have some kind of spirituality are unbiased. Yeah. Right. Maybe not even atheists, but just like that the scientific method is full of people that have zero biases. This is ridiculous. Like yeah. no one is unbiased. Everyone has preconcept preconceived ideas. You can't the only person that doesn't have preconceived ideas is like a, a Buddhist guy in deep meditation with his mind totally empty, right? Yeah. Or a baby. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they they're not do, they're not doing any thinking about stuff at the at, uh, when they're a baby or they're in deep meditation, right? That's not, you can't, as soon as you begin to cogitate, you have biases. Yeah. Uh, okay, here it is. Cremo is a member of the International Society for Krishna Consis Consciousness or Hare Krishna. He calls himself a Vedic creationist, right? So it's it's in that vein of the Vedic, the, the, the Buddhist or Hindu, whatever. Maybe Vedic is different. I'm not sure. I thought those were all kind of Hinduism. Yeah, okay. 
Krishna is Hinduism. So the point is, is that they're accusing him of being biased by his religion. Right. And I'm just like, okay. I, I think really it, it suggests, like you're saying, that you, if you're religious, you have a bias. Therefore, you can't be a scientist. Or right. you can't be – you can't look at data like – Objection, uh, objection. Yeah, objectively. Objectively. No one does. That's my point, right? Like <laughs> I, that's what I'm trying to say. Like the the reason that is disingenuous is because the implication is that us empirical scientists have no biases. Right. It's bullshit. Yeah. So, but I also I, I just <laughs> I like the focus more on like. It kind of suggests that if you're an atheist, you don't have a bias. Yeah. Right. You, yeah. You, you just accept whatever the dirt's telling you, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you have, if you follow religion, then you're, you're going to be trying to confirm your bias. Right. When you're looking at the rocks. That's or, what they're claiming. Yeah. 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 I just think that's crap. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess what I should say is like, yes, he probably is following his bias. But so does everyone, is what I mean. There is no such thing okay. as being unbiased, is what I'm trying to say. I'm, of course, Cremo is biased. His spirituality, which is a big part of his life, tells him that we've been here for millions of years. So he goes out looking for, uh, is there any scientific data that says this? And he finds it. And they're like, oh, well, he's biased. Right. I agree with that. But the reason why he had to make this book about all these forgotten or s hidden or forbidden things is because they're biased against those is my right. point. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. the implication of them accusing him of bias and claiming that that makes his argument invalid is that they have none. And that's what's bullshit about it. Yeah. I yes, agree. he's biased. But so are you. That's what I mean. Yeah. So what he's doing, unlike what they're doing, is talking about what what is it called? The, the study of knowledge. Epistemology. Yeah. yeah. And like comparing these things according to science, right? The, the best that he can. Yeah, like he's basically saying like th so. These reports I found are of the same quality yeah. and sometimes better than many of the ones that are accepted, and yet these aren't accepted. Why? Right. Right. And they're saying, well, you're just biased, and you want the humans to have been around for millions of years. And I'm like, okay, yeah. See, he is biased in a way, by his spirituality. That doesn't mean that he can't approach something scientifically. But the, but the main implication that I have a problem with is that, they're, that the, the implication is that they aren't biased. They have no biases. No, they approach this with an empty mind. And, you know, and just like what you said, they, they, only, they only are looking at what the dirt tells them. It's yeah. complete crap. <laughs> <clears throat> so I wanted to address that because you'll see this all the time. Like, like the confirmation bias thing, you can't – okay, I had this idea. Like, tell me if you think this is right. You, either you are the watcher. Like, I had this idea. I don't know if I've mentioned it before. But anyone you, – you, like, you can't, you can't accuse someone of confirmation bias if you disagree with them. It automatically, automatically makes your, your accusation invalid because your own confirmation bias makes you want to accuse them of it. You see what I'm saying? Like yeah. the only person who can legitimately accuse somebody else of confirmation bias is somebody who agrees with the guy he's accusing it of. You see what I mean? Like if we both agree on something, but I'm like, dude, you've got confirmation bias on that. Even though I also have a bias towards what you want, what you're yeah, saying is real. You're saying. Then my, then in other words, my, my, my Your accusation is m more, more valid. valid. But if I totally disagree with you, I'm like, that's just confirmation bias. That's a completely invalid argument because my own confirmation bias, which I can't help but have, is making me want to say that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, so like, but every every accusation you see of confirmation bias comes about from people who do not agree with the person and are trying to say that the only reason they've come to that conclusion is by confirmation bias. And I'm just like, well, you can't accuse them of confirmation bias when you disagree with them. In other yeah. words, your disagreement with them is making you say that. Like, yeah. it's like if he's guilty of confirmation bias, so are automatically. you. Automatically. Yes, automatically. Yeah. But the great thing about being a hypocrite is you can totally be hypocritical. Yeah, that's know? true. <laughs> <laughs> and you can be against it at the same time. You can be hypocritical and totally be against hypocrite, you know, hypocrisy. hypocrisy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> let's see. Did I have other stuff marked in here? This anomalous evidence that he presents at the very end. Uh, I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at the fallacy poster up yeah, there. trying to find one. But I'm realizing that I can't hardly read 
the uh, the names of the fallacies. Oh yeah, because it's red. red on green. Yeah, but. And also, I can't listen to you talk while I'm reading the fallacy poster. <laughs> no, it's not that one. <laughs> uh, I didn't have these marked. I'm not. I'm not fully prepared for this. Sorry about this. That's cool. I always come prepared, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's all right. Okay, so he has an article on Huatlico here, but we've gone through that. Um, so he has these weird – okay, so the iron cup from the Oklahoma coal mine. This one's a weird story. Like on January 10th, 1949, Robert Nordling sent a photograph of an iron cup to Frank L. Marsh of Andrews University in Bering Springs, Michigan. Nordling wrote, I visited a friend's museum in southern Missouri. Among his curios, he had the iron cup pictured on the enclosed snapshot. At the private museum, the Iron Cup had been displayed along with the following affidavit made by Frank J. Kenwood in Sulphur Springs, Arkansas on November 27th, 1948. So this isn't that long ago. This is the 1950s. Yeah. While I was working in the municipal electric plant in Thomas, Oklahoma in 1912, I came upon a solid chunk of coal which was too large to use. I broke it with a sledgehammer. This iron pot fell from the center, leaving an impression or mold of the pot in the piece of coal. Jim Stahl, an employee of the company, witnessed the breaking of the coal and saw the pot fall out. I traced the source of the coal and found that it came from the Wilburton, Oklahoma mines. Wilburton. According to Robert O. Fay of the Oklahoma Geological Survey, the Wilburton mine coal is about 312 million years old. Yeah. In 1966, Marsh sent the photo of the cup and correspondence relating it to Wilbert a., uh, H. Roosh, a professor of biology at Concordia College in Ann Arbor in Michigan. Marsh stated, Enclosed is the letter and snap sent me by Robert Nordling some 17 years ago. When I got interested enough in this pot, the size of which can be gotten by somewhat, gotten at somewhat by comparing it with the seat of the straight chair it is resting on, a year or two later I learned that this friend of Nordling's had died and his little museum was scattered. Nordling knew nothing of the whereabouts of the Iron Cup. It would challenge the most alert sleuth to see if he could run it down. If this cup is what it is sworn to be, it is truly a most significant artifact. It is an unfortunate fact that evidence such as this Iron Cup tends to get lost as it passes from hand to hand among people not fully aware of its significance. Yeah. I've seen the picture. I think uh, they always show it as a, they show it like uh, upside down, like bell. It looks to me like a candle holder, like the top part of a, it's got this flare at the at the top. Yeah. You know, and then it gets real steep like a bell like you you imagine like a candle a candle holder is what it looks like to me. Yeah. Or a wine glass. Like I have these um copper wine glasses. Oh yeah. Or maybe they are I think they're copper. And they flare out like that at the top mm. like a bell. Oh okay, so it could be a wine glass. Yeah. yeah. It it just it just ends at the bottom of the bell. There's no yeah. There's no stem. No stem. Yeah, yeah, which is the first thing to break on a wine glass, right? Exactly. Yeah, or on a cup. Well, oh, yeah. a goblet. <laughs> Maybe not the first thing to break. Maybe not <laughs> if it's one of those real super thin ones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's also got this incredibly beautiful filigree design on it. It's oh, that's cool. not just a, b a black iron. It's it's crazily designed. I just want to say, uh, I know we t say this all the time on the podcast, but this just. Every time these types of things come up, like the London Hammer, all of these things, a lot of the anomalies that that are rejected. Yeah, I feel like it's it's all due to the uniformitarian. It always goes back to uniformitarianism. Yeah, because these geological layers are given dates. Right, stratification. Yeah, right. So I know that there are problems in the in the dating. You know, in terms of like how long have Homo sapiens sap been around, and right. how long have they? But all of that really stems from the uniformitarianist yes. mindset. I agree that these might not be millions of years old. I totally agree with that because, yeah. like, we don't. Or they could be. I mean, I yeah, don't. Yeah. <clears throat> but but the idea that the this coal is so many millions of years old has to do with this uniformitarian idea of like subduction and whatever. Yeah. And it's like you right. know, like you've got all this uh, uh, peat. Yeah, and it's being shoved down underground by some, you know, right? Some process that must take a ridiculously long period of time because catastrophes don't happen, right? Exactly. So, <clears throat> yeah, I think what was it? Uh, to me, therein lies the the big problem. Yeah, the problem is in the dating. Methods. Is in uniformitarianism. Yeah, in, in uniformitarianism. Yeah. If we if you if you got rid of that, then 
you would lose the dates. Right. Of all, like, in other words, we couldn't go back due to what he was saying about the sites being destroyed. Yeah. And figure out, okay, well, maybe what was the, if we have this new dating for this strata. Yeah. You can't even go back and check. So the moment that it is, if it ever is, accepted that the uniformitarian idea was wrong and the dating was wrong on these layers, yeah. then all of the dating of every freaking artifact or, or fossil or whatever that we found is now lost because you can't go back and look at the site and reevaluate yeah. the dating of the layers. So yeah. it's just like wipe the slate clean. We have yes. to start over. Right. It's crazy. I had this idea that we are like in terms of time, we really are floating in this, like I picture it as an island of about 6,000 years of written history. And even the edges of that island are uh, unclear. Yes. The coastlines are, you know, the tides come in far into the island because the, the, the coastlines are big because it gets more and more uncertain. But then was, we just don't know how, how much t time before and how much time there is going to be after that island. We don't know. You yeah. know, like all of it's based on. I mean, like the, the idea of the constant of decay and, yes. you know, we would have to get rid of more than just the stratigraphy, but the constants that are in the, the cosmological ideas of science. Yeah. You know, like the, the, the well, they would, they would try to claim that anything with carbon 14 dating is pretty solid. They're like, no, that's, that's, that's based on cosmology problems uh, or that's based on cosmological ideas that have issues. Like, right. You know, and it's still based on the like, even if you just forget all the problems with how much of this stuff is incoming all the time because it's cosmogenically generated. C14 is but by cosmic rays. If you just forget, if you just pretend that that was that's been normal across history, even though it hasn't, if you forget that, you still have the problem of like assuming that carbon 14 decays at a steady rate all the time forever. Right. So, you know, and then they have so they have some fish and track stuff, which is interesting, but you still are looking at the counting fish and tracks is still relying on decay. It's just a more precise way of counting decay rate. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, a counting decay amount. Amount. And yeah. assuming the rate has been constant. This is the same, yeah. Yeah. So here's another one. A shoe sole from Nevada. We might have done this one, a brief one before, but he's got, uh, let's see, uh, October 8, 1922, the American Weekly section from the New York Sunday American ran a prominent feature titled Mystery of the Petrified Shoe Soul. Five million years old by Dr. W.H. Ballow. Ballow wrote some time ago while he was prospecting for fossils in Nevada. John T. Reed, a distinguished mining engineer and geologist, stopped suddenly. Uh, so this is a geologist that found this, okay? Yeah. It's harder to, this is why his, his information is great because it's not just some random dude. Yeah. Okay. So this geologist stops suddenly and looks down in utter bewilderment and amazement at a rock near his feet. For, the, for there... A part of the rock itself was what seemed to be a human footprint. Closer inspection showed that it was not a mark of a naked foot, but was apparently a shoe sole, which had been turned into stone. Oh, I think I remember seeing a picture of this one. A forepart was missing, but there was the outline of at least two thirds of it. And around this outline ran a well-defined sewn thread. Yes. Which had, it appeared, attached the welt to the sole. Further on was another line of sewing, and in the center where the foot would have rested had the object really been a shoe sole, there was an indentation exactly such as what had been made by the foot, or the bone of the heel rubbing upon and wearing down the material of which the sole had been made. Thus was found a fossil which is the foremost mystery of science today, for the rock in which it was found is at least five million years old, right? They just announced that, right. like, it's a given. This rock is five right. million years old, and we know this. Like, well, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Everything else, like, all the rest of your ideas about human development point that that rock is not that old, but you just say, well, this is a giant mystery because they, we know that this rock is this old. Well, yeah, exactly. Why do you do that? Reed brought the specimen to New York where he tried to bring it to the attention of other scientists. Reed reported, On arrival in New York, I showed this fossil to Dr. James F. Kemp, geologist of Columbia University. Professors H. F. Osborne, W. D. Matthew, and E. O. Hovey of the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, oh, yeah, there's a picture of it, a little picture. All of these men reached the same conclusion, in effect, that, quote, it was the most remarkable natural imitation of an artificial object they had ever seen. Ah! <laughs> uh. These experts agreed, however, that the rock formation was Triassic, and manufacturers of shoes agreed that the origin or that originally the specimen was a hand welted sole. 
Dr. W.D. Matthews wrote a brief report on the find, declaring that while all the semblances of the shoe were present, including the threads upon which it had been sewn, it was only a remarkable imitation, a lucis naturae, or a freak of nature. Curiously enough, an inquiry by us to the American, us being Michael Cremo and his partner, to the American Museum of Natural History resulted in a reply that the report by Matthew is not in their files. Reed, despite Matthew's dismissal, nevertheless persisted. I next got a hold of a micro, uh, micro photog wow, micro photographer, photographer, micro photographer. There we go. And an analytical chemist of the Rockefeller Institute who on the outside, so, uh, who on the outside, so as to not make it an Institute matter, made photos and analyses of the specimen. The analyses proved, proved up, uh, or removed any doubt of the shoe sole having been subjected to Triassic fossilization. The microphoto magnifications are 20 times larger than the specimen itself, showing the minutest detail of the thread twist and warp, <laughs> proving conclusively oh. that the shoe sole is not a resemblance, but is strictly the handiwork of man. Even to the naked eye, the threads can be seen distinctly, <clears throat> and the definitely symmetrical outlines uh, of the shoe sole. And, let's see, yeah, okay. And inside this rim and running parallel to it is a line which appears to be regularly perforated as if for stitches. I may add that at least two geologists whose names will develop someday have admitted that the shoe is a shoe sole is valid, a genuine fossilization in Triassic rocks. The Triassic rock bearing the fossil shoe sole is now recognized as being far more than 5 million years old. The Triassic period is now generally dated at 213 to 248 million years ago. So he got people to take minute ph photographs of the yeah, the, the, the actual thread and you, can, you can see, see the, the turns of the threads <laughs> yeah dude it's freaking awesome <laughs> i love it and so this is this is probably one of my favorite of all his anomalies the block wall and the mine so he's got the details you remember this story i don't know let's hear ww w. mccormick of abilene texas yeah reported his grandfather's account, my grandfather's grandfather's account, of a stone block wall that was found deep within a coal mine. In the year 1928, I, Atlas At Alman Mathis, was working in a coal mine number five, located two miles north of Heavener, Oklahoma. This was a shaft mine, and they told us it was two miles deep. The mine was so deep that they let us down into it in an elevator, and they pumped air down to us. It was so deep. So, like, you, yeah. without air being pumped in there, they would die of asphyxiation, I assume. Yeah. Uh, the, this report was reprinted in a book by Bra uh, Brad Steiger. One evening, evening, Mathis was blasting coal loose by explosives in room number 24 of this mine. So they have the, the shaft, and then there's drifts yeah. going off in a T-way, and then there's rooms coming off them where each individual guy sets up his charges, right? And then they yeah. all leave the mine, set off all the charges at once, and then they all go back down in the next day when the dust has settled and cl start clearing it out. It's a freaking crazy job yeah, right two there. Two miles down. <laughs> uh, it's a crazy job. <laughs> the next morning, said Mathis, there were several concrete blocks laying in the room. These blocks were 12-inch cubes and were so smooth and polished on the outside that all six sides could have served as mirrors. Whoa. Yet they were full of gravel because I chipped one of them open with my pick and it was plain concrete on the inside. Mathis added, as I started to timber the room up, it caved in and I barely escaped. When I came back after the cave-in, a solid wall of these polished blocks was left exposed. So, like, the cave-in was basically yeah. the rest of the coal falling off falling the wall. Falling off of it, yeah. <sighs> About 100 to 150 yards farther down our air core, the drift that they're in, another miner struck the same wall or one very similar. 150 yards. Okay, we're just talking about a big wall here. The coal in the mine was probably carboniferous, which would mean the wall was at least 286 million years old, according to the standard model. According to Mathis, the mining company officers immediately pulled the men out of the mine and forbade them to speak about what they had seen. This mine was closed in the fall of 1928, and the crew went to mine number 24 near Wilburton, Oklahoma. Mathis said the Wilburton miners told of finding, quote, a solid block of silver in the shape of a barrel, with the prints of the staves on it. The coal from what? Wilburton was formed between 280 and 320 million years ago. <laughs> Dude, that's nuts. So they're finding these objects that are of some kind of intelligent manufacturer yeah. deep in these coal mines. And this, these, these two stories are like extreme, not extreme, but like big versions of like, there's so many stories of like this widow or whatever breaks open her little piece of coal to put it in her, and there's a gold chain. You yeah. Know? 
and the impression of the gold chain. Jane is in the, in the coal, like, uh, and the one co- piece of coal still has the gold chain sticking out of it, yeah. you know, and she takes it to the doctor, the town doctor, and then he shows it to all these scientists. And there's so yeah. many of those stories. And it's just like, okay, how, at, how at can, what point does this, it, like, it, is, was there a, a coal artifact hoax fad? <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Over over 50 years, you know. Right. And Cremo's point with his stories on here is that his are very hard to discount because they're all done by like this is a geologist, right? Yeah. You know, or they, they have the they have all these affidavits where people were basically signing like under perjury charges basically that yeah. that they were not lying, you know, with all these witnesses of people that they respected. Yeah. So, like Usually when you get somebody to sign an affidavit, they're telling the truth. Like, you're not going to sign an affidavit for something that didn't happen because yeah. that's, you know, you can be brought up for perjury charges, but basically. Yeah. So I just find that to be interesting. Like, like if I wrote a, a, a false story they for a newspaper. close the freaking mine. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. I mean, I guess maybe the miner, like the, the mining company was like, okay, we're going to lose the property. Yeah, unstable. Unstable. We don't know. Like we've now we've we don't run know into what's a in different there. structure. Yeah. It's dangerous to to blast. We don't want anybody to die. Right. Blah, blah 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 blah. In other words, that there could be non conspiracy related reasons for shutting the mine down. Yeah, but I also but it's think still there. Right. That's yeah. what I say. I'm always like it's still out there. I al- I also think of the idea that like they don't want to get the they don't want to get the claims taken from them. Right. They just went to number another mine in the same area. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. But if there, if if like it got let out that there was this enormous construction of something ancient down there, then the, the whole thing would be taken from them. They wouldn't be able to mine there at all anymore. Uh, yeah. You know, this I think this happens to oil companies too. Like people have this, you know, they talk about how oh this oil company went out into the jungle out there and there was a pyramid and they flattened it, you know, or they didn't tell anybody about it or whatever. Or like these people, these these oil, these giant energy corporations that have uh, that have hired various. Uh, Various prospectors or whatever. Well, yeah, various uh, types of companies to do deep sea the floor mapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they find strange structures or strange anomalies on the seafloor, but they don't tell anybody about it yet. Not because they're hiding the story of the human race, but because they don't want to lose. They don't want to lose the ability to 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 keep yeah to go looking, for resources yeah. there. Yeah. So, like, I don't know. It could be both. You can. It's it's hard to tell. Yeah. But like, there are plenty of landowners who, if they find. They, you know, you find a, you find something ancient on your property. You were like, oh shit! Don't yeah, tell anybody because lose I'll lose it. my property, right? Yeah. This it's is why I'm. Ag- yeah. This is why I'm against like the kind of laws that allow governments to snatch property away from people. Yeah. Because then they wouldn't be afraid to tell, right? You know, if you have these things like we, we should be able to, to, to go in and and like, protect these ancient sites, but if you put in the laws that you're going to take the property away from whoever owns it then they're not going to tell you it's there and you can't protect the site. Right. Right. So either it doesn't get protected and just it gets utterly destroyed hidden or the the property owner destroys it in fear of losing his property or yeah. whatever. Like it's the it's totally it, it's like works the opposite of what they're supposed they want it to work, yeah, you know. So many things. Yeah. Like that. Un- unintended consequences or yeah. maybe they're intended. Like let's make these laws so that people will destroy these artifacts because we don't want this story getting out there. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, my, conspiracy. that's my conspiracy. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> uh. All right. I think that's it. <laughs> right. We ran out of time. Yep. Long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, you had to finish that. Yeah. Yeah. I that did have good. to finish it. All right, well, you guys can email us at brothersoftheserpent at gmail.com. You can go to the website, brothersoftheserpent.com. And please comment on the website. And check out the encyclopedia and the glossary, which have lots of the terms that we use there, the ones we made up and the ones that are not made up but have Snake Bros descriptions. Yeah, follow us on Twitter and share the episodes if you if you like it. That's right. And don't forget to donate to our pyramid scheme. Yeah. Send yes. us your two cents or your million dollars. Yeah. Straight to pyramids. <laughs> Straight to pyramids. <laughs> and give us reviews. You guys have been doing awesome at that. Thank you very much. But remember, you can give us reviews on iTunes. Any, re- any five-star review helps spread the show. So thank you guys very much. Thanks a lot. Yep. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work.